And it's episode 55, Red Leaf WrestleCast, titled Empty Arena Passion. I'm your host, JD. <laughs> Mom, you're starting like off it. right away today. I am. Well, let me ask you, are we doing uh, the day after April Fool's Day, too? April 1st, you mean? April 2nd. April 2nd was a Thursday. Yeah. April Fool's Day, yeah. Uh, are we doing April Fool's Day? Yeah, of course. All right. Well, then give me a second here. <laughs> Why? You got to get up and go get your notes? Well, I guess she does. Oh, we're off to a great start. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I had to grab my other notes. Sorry about that. Well, here on this special episode, <laughs> there is still no shortage of wrestling because the great thing of doing a retro cast is no matter what, I will always have the retro wrestling to fall back on. And with all these empty arena shows happening and less wrestling happening, uh, now more than ever, probably in probably since 2001 <laughs> or 2002, we got uh, three special matches that you wanted to watch, Mom, uh, before yes. we get into AEW, as we do every episode. Oh, we're doing retro first? We will do retro first because oh, the, podcast, the podcast always starts off with recommended matches from outside promotions. And one of those three matches was a recommended match. Once we get done with AEW, uh, no WXW, no indie wrestling as they are shut down. Uh, but Ice Ribbon had a show. I'll be getting into that later uh, by my lonesome, w along with the uh, next Empty Arena Dragon Gate show. Uh, that was at Passion Gate, or Gate of Passion. And then that goes into, from there, all of the retro stuff. All Japan Women, uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling through the 90s, and WCW Nitro, the Fallout show from Halloween Havoc, which, in the last episode, you were on, Mom. I certainly was. You were. We uh, we had a blast doing that. It was a very long episode in total. <laughs> I think you on that podcast alone clocked in at just shy of three hours. <laughs> when you put it all together. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I guess I had a lot to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, except the Hogan Warrior match. You're just like, that was shit. Let's move on. <laughs> you just refused to let me talk about it. And you didn't want to no. talk about because yeah. it was atrocious. I didn't want to talk about it. It was. <laughs> it was so bad. Well, a little spoiler uh, for the Nitro section. Uh, the next night on Nitro, and I have no memory of this until I watched it. Uh, yeah. Apparently, there was an issue with the cable companies during the pay-per-view. And uh, they shut the pay-per-view off early because they went overtime. And WCW planned on going overtime and didn't tell them. So the uh -huh. end of the Hogan Warrior match, like 20% of the wow. people that watched the pay-per-view didn't get to see it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I bet they wanted their money back. Uh, yeah. Uh, WCW yeah. lost over a million dollars because of that fuck up. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Did they have to pay back? Oh, yeah. They had the to give back the refunds. people paid for that? Oh, yeah. Wow. So I'll go into a little bit more detail with that and how that atrocious Nitro episode happened later. But let's get right <laughs> into our little section here. Um, heading into this episode, especially after watching Halloween Havoc, you had the desire to watch two old uh, retro matches yourself. Yeah. And with Yay, my faves. And with uh, Jake the Snake Roberts being a, a big component of Dynamite these days on TNT... You wanted to watch an old Jake the Snake match. Absolutely, because I, I, you know, you see what they are today, but as as we all know, we get older. We're not all 21. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was kind of nice to uh, refresh my memory of back in the day. And, and it ends up being really fun because you see the difference in... Um, how less of athleticism in the 
older days, uh, you know, of wrestling into the athleticism that's going on right now with the wrestling. Mm-hmm. It's it's such a um, difference of performance and how much more they do today. I mean, there's a lot of things they still do, but the way it's being done today is so much different than what it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, it's been a lot of, it's to me, it's a lot of fun to see um, what the rest the difference in physique wise, um, you know, because we're talking about uh, what an impact steroids were during the eighties, nineties, um, Mid, into even the mid 2000s mm-hmm. yep absolutely you know and um and how much the physiques have changed from you know seeing that uh and i never even th- knew about steroids until later on when it became uh in all of the sports baseball basketball football um and then, of course, into wrestling. And then to see your wrestlers today that are actually um, quite different physique-wise, and they aren't so heavy-footed, and you have so much more athleticism, I think, because of that. And it's kind of of, um, quite the comparison. So it was pretty interesting for me to see relive that moment to see what I'm seeing today against what I was seeing 30 years ago. It's quite a, quite a difference. And, um, I think that's why I enjoy what I'm watching today more. So, uh, because of that, it's, it's so much more action in today's wrestling and, um, and actually watching the retro, knowing that these wrestlers are heavy footed, are on steroids. Yes, some of them claim, you know, yes, I, I did steroids, but not not a whole lot of it. Mm-hmm. But they still did them. Um, and you can just see the difference in um, just their performance with the wrestling. Uh, so in that segue, um, the first match we watched was uh, Jake, the snake versus macho man. Um, That was a lot of fun. Yes. From WWF Saturday night's main event in 1992. Yeah, that was, it was a fun match. That was a fun match. Uh, uh, You know, I was looking at some of the (laughs) matches that Jake, the snake really didn't win very many. (laughs) No, he he really didn't. And, you know, yes, he went through his um, uh, dark, dark time um, and uh, it cost him dearly, uh, you know, almost cost him his life um, to to a degree. And and so um, that's the unfortunate side of Jake the Snake. I'm really glad that we get to see him in today. Um, that he is recovered. He uh, will always be recovering. Um, that sure. never stops. That never stops. But it was a, a great match to watch. Um, just seeing Mr. Slim Jim Macho Man. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it was cool because we, we saw the big pre-match yeah. promo from Macho Man. Uh, talk, yeah. uh, this uh, For reference of everybody, this is uh, one of Jake the Snake's most famous rivalries. This It involved... Uh, Jake Roberts stalking Macho Man and his wife, Miss Elizabeth, uh, even going as far as hitting Macho Man with the snake to bite him in the arm, which w- which uh, scarred many people <laughs> at the time. It was very shocking. <laughs> so Macho Man gave a, gave a big... Kind of like, kind of like when, um, uh, what's his name, you know, chopped the head off of the chicken or whatever right. it was. Yeah. Yeah. So Macho Man gave a big uh, pre-match promo. Basically going over all of his previous promos and telling the story, hyping up the match. So, no surprise there. Macho Man cut a good uh, promo. And then, um, it didn't have to go into Jake the Snake cutting a promo at all. Because the story told itself where he was the stalker. And then you had Gorilla Monsoon and uh, Bobby Heenan on commentary. 
uh, kind of telling, giving us the big question: Will Miss Elizabeth, uh, despite Jake Roberts' <laughs> stalking, uh, come to ringside? And then, as soon as Macho Man's music hits, there's Miss Elizabeth in a big, big, nice dress, uh, gets in the ring, and then uh, Roberts comes out, and he's all. He's a big dude, right? He's huge. Uh, I think that's a thing that a lot of people forget is how big Jake Roberts was and is. Oh, yeah. Well, he still is a big man. He, st- I mean, he still is, but he, yeah. he towers over Macho Man. He had a big yeah. commanding presence. Uh, even when he's out of shape, he still looks kind of in shape at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, an, um, an in-shape dad bod, we could say. <laughs> sure so and and uh it's funny you mention how much you you like the athleticism and everything today and i think uh a lot of retro or old school fans uh don't like that as much because there's too much high flying not enough selling uh not trying to get the match enough uh, off uh it's telling a much different story than what you used to you have to change with the times and i i actually yes. think it's more exciting uh i i like you know there's people that want that old school you know go back to basics kind of thing but um you you don't have that today you have uh young younger wrestlers i think than you did back back then too um or maybe they just looked older because they were on steroids. They looked, o- they looked older because of the, the hard lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's still a, it's still a harder lifestyle um, in a lot but of absolutely. in a lot of ways, at least, especially oh, yeah. in the WWE world where they do 300 dates a year, and uh, mm-hmm. AEW is not doing that. They're doing 50 to 60 dates a year. Yeah. Uh, but and yeah, still that's a lot. And still, that's a lot. But I think you know, I think the young bucks said it right. You know that. They finally have, you know, they're they're meeting on Wednesday and they actually have a weekend off. Right. That they, you know, and where WWE is, oh, my God, they're ridiculous. And no, you don't have any time for anything else. And you get you get saturated and, and burn out a lot quicker when you do that. Well, to your wrestlers. So I'm glad we actually watched the 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 two retro matches that we did. Getting into uh, spoiler the Boneyard match. So stay tuned for that in a second. So Jake the Snake yeah. and Macho Man had a had a reason to fight, right? Mm-hmm. That that in itself is a story, and the fact that they had a story involving Jake stalking Miss Elizabeth. If you were a man and your woman was getting haunted by Another guy, you would want to beat his ass, right? Right. So, what did they do immediately upon Jake Roberts getting in the ring? What happened? You tell me. Okay. They, Macho Man, (laughs) pounced on him and immediately started punching his face in. And then they brawled outside, guardrails, hit him against the post. It was a fight, right? True that. What's... I think a lot of old school fans and retro fans, because I like retro wrestling, but you do have to look at it in different eyes. This, however, Mm. is a case of what I think a lot of retro fans are missing in the connection of today's wrestling, because there is this Mm. missing. And that is very often one of two things is going to happen in a modern wrestling match with of a story, something like this. A, it'll be. They'll go into a stipulation match, last man standing, street fight, et cetera, et cetera, right? They'll do that. And that mm-hmm. will be their reason to fight. Okay? Mm-hmm. Or they just go about their business like it's a show. So I'll give you an example. Uh in 2019, there was a feud between uh the Miz and Bray Wyatt the Fiend. And he was, like, in his house stalking his wife and child. They have a match, right? And just like here, it's very similar when you think about it. Uh, Macho Man pounced on Jake Roberts, beat his ass, and it was very quick, right? They just beat the hell out of each other. In the match I'm referencing, Miz versus Fiend, Miz, Miz's music hits, and he comes out smiling. He twirls, points to the crowd, no big deal, 
right? And then right. the fiend comes to the ring, and the ref is like, "No, backing off." And the the fiend goes through his whole spiel, and then they lock up, like it's a wrestling match. They don't have a fight, right? In this one, Macho Man was seething at the teeth. He came in first. Jake Roberts was hesitant to get in the ring, and as soon as he stepped into into those ropes, there was no introductions. There was no Jake Roberts like has a sack and he must show his snake and parade it to the crowd. No, they just had mm-hmm, a fight, mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. in that sense, it's that is telling the story in the match. It's continuing mm-hmm. it, and that mm-hmm. and it's things like that that's missing in a lot of today's wrestling. Mm-hmm. There, there's okay. the disconnect. I think where where okay. it's all happening. Yeah. In that sense, okay. I can agree. Yeah. Well, you know, and and here's the thing too, though. So you have WWE who continues those stupid stories, and they are they are somewhat pretty stupid, mm-hmm. you know. And I think AEW needs to go uh, a little different uh, or a lot different to to um, go try something new. Because, you know, um, they're still sticking with some stories, but it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, a year, <laughs> a story for a year. It doesn't have to be, but there are some that you can kind of play out that way. And they have. Yeah. And they have. They, they you know, right now you've got the story with Paige and, and his drinking uh, deal, um, you know. So there's that. You got the Omega Paige Hmm, are they going to still be a team? Um, you know, uh, now you got, um, oh God, I can't um, you got the Dark Order storyline. You got the Dark Order, the minions. I, st- I, I miss the minions. Oh, they're still there. We're getting, <laughs> they're there, but they're not really. But anyway, um, I don't know. I, I, I think AEW is doing just fine with their stories, but, um, you know, maybe the old schools want, um, bigger stories, bigger, bigger names. Is that what their problem is? I don't know. Well, I mean, star power is definitely one thing. And there's a lot to be said with a lack of top stars and top draws. Well, you Uh, got loser Cody. There's a story in itself with yeah. a stupid tattoo. Yeah. You know, you could be on that tattoo well, neck we'll get there. thing uh, for years. <laughs> so I think he just needs a skin graft. <laughs> get that thing off his neck. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, but uh, it was a good story. But you know, I mean, and and Jake the Snake and Macho Man had have a lot of matches together throughout the year. A lot. Well, they have a lot Years. of house show matches. They work and work and work and work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eventually, it leads to a cage match. Uh, and then this is all kind of building up. It was supposed to build up Jake the Snake Roberts um, and Macho Man in itself. Uh, mm-hmm. Jake the Snake was on a crash course to, I believe, The Undertaker at WrestleMania in 92. And then right after mm-hmm. that, he went to WCW. for, And then his demons kind of caught up with him. And right. 1992 Macho Man, I want to say he wasn't far behind going to WCW mm-hmm. afterwards as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so Jake the Snake lot, misses. Lot, uh, yeah, a lot, lot, lot was changing in those t- in that the early 90s, mid 90s. Yes, for sure, a lot of change. Mm-hmm. So Jake, uh, yeah, to finish the match change. real quick, Jake the Snake misses a DDT. As Macho Man holds the ropes, immediately hits his elbow, gets the three count, and then uh, he wasn't done beating his ass. He like starts going crazy. A lot of people get in the ring. He gets the ring bell and swings it around uh, to further <laughs> say that we're not done, right? I still need to beat you up. Right. And the snake slithers away. <laughs> Macho Man, the American way. Yeah. And then we cut to a two. Cut to two years later. In one of my favorite matches of all time, which I've seen countless times, is uh, Bret yeah. Hart versus Owen Hart, 1994, WrestleMania 10, also in Madison Square Garden. Right. 
Yeah, that was a good. I I I thought this was a, a great match. Great match. Uh, seeing these guys together. It was a long freaking match. Yeah, it was over twenty minutes. Uh, the big story <laughs> of match. the big story of Owen Hart wants to get out of his brother's shadow. Uh, right. He's going by the rocket. This is big heel right. Owen Run. Uh, wants to get the big rub from Brett, but he has to beat him. And the long term story of Brett refusing to fight his brother. He goes, "I will not fight right. my brother." Even pre match right. promos going. You know what, brother in arms. We don't need to find out who the better wrestler is. We're brothers and. Right. Owen Hart's not handling that. He's like, no, I got, I got a lot to prove. Like you were already champion, Brett. I was not. Situation. So, how old was uh, Brett Hart and Owen Hart at this time? Do we know? Uh, I don't recall. I'd have to look it up. Yeah, I'd really like to know how old they were at that time. Well, Brett was in his prime, and then Owen was just about to get there. Just coming in. Yeah. So let's let's yeah. say Brett was in his he was maybe thirty two, and Owen was twenty eight, twenty seven. Let's just say that. Mm-hmm. That's what it mm-hmm. feels like. Uh, yes, this was a ve- this was a much more modern match, and it holds up extremely well because there's some high flying, there's some wrestling exchanges, there's some fighting. Uh, and then there's both guys trying to do everything they can to win, and it really showed. And I loved the entrances in this. This was great camera work, which is he something was, I can't Brett say. Brett the Heart was 37. At this time? Yes. Oh, wow. That's way later. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was 37 at this time. So that's a little perspective. That's the same age as Kenny Omega. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that means Owen was probably 32 then. Perhaps. Um, yeah. So the the camera work, again, was pretty awesome with uh, the rocket getting his entrance first, and he's, he's ripping the glasses up and the lights. Uh, he was 29. 29. Okay. I was more closer mm-hmm. the first time. I thought I thought they were only like five or six years apart, but I guess not. Apparently not. Even further. Um, but yeah. when Brett's Brett's music hit, and you see the tunnel with the black and pink lights, right? Yeah. And Brett yeah. comes out, and the camera zooms in on the on the tunnel, and the crowd's just going crazy. I was like, that's in a in a lot of ways, that's the, a presentation of making a star feels like a star. And then, uh-huh. and then Owen has to kind of earn that extra, let's call it camera work and presentation. There was, there was, to me, there was more being said, just in the entrances alone and what both guys were trying to prove. Brett was a star already, and Owen, yeah, yeah, was wanting to be that. Yeah, uh, and the match felt like it. Uh, Owen going after the legs, which also told a story in its path, uh, in its past, and all built up. Uh, to one maneuver where Brett's going for a kind of victory roll off of Owen's shoulders, and he steps in, and Owen plants him and gets the big pin. Mm-hmm. Gives him yeah, the big was... middle finger as he's on his butt, and then <laughs> salutes to the crowd as well and gets out of there. Well, and this was this was uh, pretty much uh, Owen's breakout after that, right? It was exactly it. That This was yeah. the match that got yeah. him to... Uh, reach another level and yeah again something we don't see in uh, i think enough of is a story of a younger guy beating an established star at a big stage too often i think in modern times we don't see the young guy go over like this it's always well we'll do it later or they just got they got the big rub just being in the ring, being in the match. I'm like, no. Mm-hmm. No one mm-hmm. remembers second place, right? right. You don't remember right. who got the silver medal f- uh, for six Olympics in a row. You remember right. the guy who got the gold medal once. <laughs> right. <laughs> True that. Yep. And wrestling has to, like, it's okay in the Olympics, because then you could just, you could, you could look it up and say, oh, they were silver medalists, like six Olympics in a row. That's... Nothing to sneeze at. Oh, but they never won the big one. In wrestling, you, it, because it's such a presentation and star power 
built business, if you don't have those stars to go over, then no one remembers that second place, right? Everyone mm-hmm. feels like a silver medalist. Mm-hmm. You've got to have the gold medalist. And right now, at this, t- at this moment in time, Brett was the gold medalist. He was the former champion, about to become the champion again. And Owen Hart wasn't even a bronze medalist. He was that no-name guy that always came up short, and this was his big win, right? Yeah. And it was the it was yeah. the presentation of it all, saying I got one over on him, and yeah. bragging that it was a victory roll, and I earned it. it. There was no interference, there was no cheating. It was that I loved it. Right. Yep. I did too. And it was fifty. I like Jake the Snake. Yeah, I like Jake the Snake, but I. I... I'm just a Owen Hart, Bret Hart fan. I always, I always had been. Um, they were, they were my uh, favorite wrestlers. Even before you got Bret Hart's glasses. <laughs> <laughs> but that was really exciting. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now we're on to modern times. Cut to 2020, so we go from 92 and 94 to 2020. Uh, uh, the Undertaker versus AJ Styles at WWE Corona Mania, the Boneyard match. Corona Mania? You heard oh. me. <laughs> <laughs> COVID Mania. <laughs> Corona Mania. Like, what Rolls the off hell? the tongue, too. Yeah, it does. Yeah, Corona Mania. So, you watched oh, this Lord. match in a vacuum, and at the end of it, you still had kind of the same opinion as I did. I'm going to mm-hmm. give you the quick story that they tried to build for this match. You ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so AJ Styles uh, goes to Saudi Arabia with WWE, and there's a uh, a, a gauntlet match thing and you get a um, trophy that looks like the aggro crag AJ Styles and his goons are all talking shit and uh, they end up taking out a dude backstage him and his cronies um, beat him up and then AJ's like ah give me the give me the thing I'm gonna win camera cuts to the back his cronies are beat up on the ground Undertaker comes out coat and all walks to the ring takes a million years Gets in the ring, chokeslams AJ one time, and pins him. So Undertaker wasn't in the match. He just inserted himself in. One move, pins AJ Styles. Okay? Okay. Encounter 2 was at the next uh, network special event, where in between AJ was all, all mad that The Undertaker got in his business, right? So he starts saying, um, your wife wants you to make money. This is the only reason why you're still here. blah blah Starts calling him Mark Calloway and all this, all this real name stuff, right? <laughs> so AJ has... Ouch! Yeah, so AJ has a no... D- yeah, ouch, right? It's like, whatever. He's, he's all mad he got beat, like, easily, too. So at the next network special, he's in a match with another dude. It's a no disqualification match. So then it's three on one. Undertaker's, the lights go out. Undertaker shows up, beats all three of them up. And then the other guy pins Styles. So that's two times in a row. Undertaker just pops up, beats his ass, and leaves. (laughs) So now, let me ask you, during these two times, uh, uh, Undertaker is dressed as the Undertaker? Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. He's not, he's not exposing um, or you know putting on normal clothes. No, he's he is not his, Mark Calloway. He's wearing his clo- big cloak and his yes. big hat. And... Well, at least for the entrance in Saudi Arabia, he was. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So in between then that networks. So AJ Styles has been beaten up twice. Now it's to Corona Mania here. And AJ Styles gets up, he keeps getting on the mic, getting on the mic. Ah, Michelle, your wife this, your wife that. Same spiel, right? Uh huh. And then they just announce a uh, boneyard match. And Undertaker cuts a promo. Holy Trinity, I'll see you. I'll see you at the graveyard site, whatever. I'll beat your ass. It's like, great. Okay. Weak. You know, no, no <laughs> snakes biting anyone's arms, no stalking women. 
you know i'm gonna i'm gonna get you it's just it's just well i beat your ass twice i'll do it a third time i guess <laughs> all right okay and here we are aj styles uh comes in a hearst does a little swerve you think it's the undertaker gonna pop out of the coffin aj styles music hits and he's like ah ha, 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 i'm in the graveyard right i really wish the undertaker had come out of the the um hearse instead of stupid styles <laughs> it would have been a, you know much better no, uh, that but, see, then you wouldn't have gotten 2001 Undertaker on his motorcycle coming out to the new Metallica song. Yeah, that's true. You wouldn't have had that. Hey, true. So, what did you think of this B horror movie thing that you saw? Favorite moments, so fa- things you didn't my- like. <laughs> the first thing that I wrote was Dang, this is such an old guy match. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it kind of felt like an old I, Steven Seagal movie when Steven Seagal's in right, his 50s. <laughs> right. You know, Undertaker's, what, 54 years old? 55. Uh, you know, 55, you know, um, not bad. You know, you know, he's a big, he's a big boy. Very mismatch. I can see why Undertaker would kick AJ Styles ass. <laughs> AJ AJ is it's like a he's a Marco against ah. uh, <laughs> Well it sure came across that way to me anyways. Right? He's like a Marco with against the Undertaker. It was there no possibility. You know, he, he um he reminds me of Lurch from the Adams family. He's he's a big boy and there ain't nothing that's gonna put him down. You know, I just, uh, <laughs> AJ was, was like a rag doll. And it reminded me of Archer and Marco from last week. <laughs> from last week. It was stupid. It was a stupid match. Oh. I know. You didn't like I, it? I know. It. Okay. Let me put it this way. I. Sort of liked it because I hadn't seen Undertaker. I've ne- I've never seen Undertaker without his stuff on. Incorrect. You don't remember the Undertaker because okay. it's been so long. Thank you. So <laughs> I have never seen in my mind. <laughs> You've forgotten about it. I have forgotten. You know what he truly looks like. Um, probably hasn't changed much. Um, but, uh, I liked seeing the undertaker. I don't, I didn't like AJ because he was just, it, it was, he was stupid. I would have liked to have seen somebody else against the undertaker, but I get the deal with the AJ and, you know, animosity against mm-hmm. the undertaker. Cause he's buried him so many times, you know, um, uh, but, um, there was lots of huffing and puffing. Oh, you know? there certainly was. It was like Blood. it was like he was having an <laughs> asthma attack. <laughs> Must be really warm where they're at. <laughs> well, they're in Florida, so. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. So they were huffing and puffing. You know, they were. I, I call them blood beaters because there was. <laughs> there was a lot of blood. Oh, I mean, um, yeah. Undertaker hit a. Uh, Hit the Hearst windshield with a, uh, yeah. he had like a small lead, I guess, cylinder yeah, of some kind. Yeah, he was going kind. for AJ's head. Yeah. It, it hit the glass instead, bit. yeah. It, uh, yeah. Boom. And then, uh, but I did like it when he threw AJ off the roof. That was pretty oh, the cool. the big choke and, slam and, off the roof. Yeah, and his other minions, AJ's minions that he had. See, I, know, I still around. don't understand what that all was, because... Styles is just getting the shit kicked out of him like 90% of this entire affair, right? Maybe someone was trying to save him. I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't, kitty cat. <laughs> Mine's meowing in the background. Oh, yeah, that's why I say it. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so then a- Anderson and Gallo show up, his cronies, the guys who have <laughs> gotten the shit kicked out of him by Undertaker twice now. Oh, is that who they were? But, that, but then they step aside and a bunch of druids come out. Okay. And I'm like, who are you? Why are you here? Are you Undertaker's druids? 
but then Undertaker beats them all up. Like one punch, they're out. There's like nine of them. <laughs> so it's like a, it's like twelve on one technically, and it doesn't matter. So th- this entire affair was Undertaker looking great again. It was a total rehabilitation of who the Undertaker is, and he because the last few times he's been out, his matches aren't haven't been very good. He's old, huffing and puffing, you know, a lot of selling and. He kind of did that here in one instance where after it's the nine on one, mm-hmm. AJ Styles hits him with a uh, soapstone gravestone <laughs> and beats him up for a minute or two, right? Low, kicks him in the nuts kind of situation and and uh, throws him in the empty grave that Styles had dug, I guess, two days prior. <laughs> uh uh, there was the, the best moment was definitely when he's in the the backhoe, the backhoe tractor thing. He turns it on and he's laughing, and then the lights bang from behind, and Undertaker's there behind him. And I don't know who ever turned that backhoe off. I still wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the key being turned off? I didn't. No. Mom, are you still there, or did you freeze? Uh oh. My yeah, my my absolute favorite part was well, I liked <laughs> I liked when the Undertaker got thrown into the the uh, what do you call it the grave, grave, right? Yeah. And then AJ's on the the uh, shovel. And then the Undertaker shows up behind him. Yeah. And he goes, oh, I guess I shouldn't have done that. Well, that kind of cute old school Undertaker with the mm -hmm. the spooky powers. And from then, again, it was him just beating the shit out of the whole trio. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Which, you know, (laughs) which is good. I did like the shit talking Undertaker was doing the whole time. Yeah, because, uh, you know, um, you really don't hear anything out of The Undertaker, ever. Well, not his old persona, right? No. That was part of his no. biker gimmick. Yeah. So hear- hearing him actually have a voice uh, was kind of cool. So <laughs> How old am I, AJ? I- <laughs> What's my wife's name? And you're, yeah, what's my voice? That was name? really funny when he said that, and you just go, "Bitch!" <laughs> <laughs> I was dying. <laughs> that's right, bitch. That's my name. That's her name. You're right. <laughs> Too bad he didn't use do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, he's dragging AJ back to the grave, back to the grave, and he's got him under his shoulder, and AJ is like, "Don't bury me." I was like, "Man, it's your." I was like, "What a line that is!" It really <laughs> stuck out, stuck out to me, dude. Yeah, don't, don't bury me. Yeah. So it was a, it was a huge rehabili- rehabilitation of the Undertaker. I'm sure they'll do a few more matches out of this, get a bunch of money out mm-hmm. of it. Uh, that, that was the whole goal to it. That's all well and good. Okay. I was highly entertained. Yeah. I'm definitely with you though. On if, if this was the goal, I guess AJ was the best opponent. But the build was just so bad. I'm like, he just got the shit kicked out of him for like three months. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, kind of like a Cody thing, you know? You got to have a loser. Yeah, well, AJ <laughs> definitely got buried and lost. So who knows right. when the next time we'll see him. But Is AJ uh, a loser anyways? I don't know. Um, Ever since he lost the title, I don't recall any feuds he's had that he's... One. Oh, is he on his way to AEW then? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, he signed. He resigned a deal recently. Oh, oh well, he's a dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Making a bunch of money. So, yeah. Well, that's why he's getting the shit kicked out of him then. Yeah, by the Undertaker. Yeah. Uh huh. There's gonna be a man. good loser. Yeah. Right. How, how? And yeah, how old is AJ Styles? What? Forty. Twenty-seven. Oh, 43. Oh, it is an old man match then. Yeah, <laughs> it was. All right, good. 
<laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's get into AEW. There's just um, let's just do it. Let's just do it. I, I do have a, a drop to play. Would you like to hear your boy Darby Allen's music? Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, AEW Dynamite, uh, April 1st, number 26, and April 8th, number 27. Uh, Notes from Dark is they are still doing uh, kind of pre-taped shortened episodes, uh, showcasing a bunch of indie talent uh, to the southeastern region of the United States, which is really cool to see. I do like uh, seeing all these younger guys get a chance to work and the indie guys waiting for a chance to break out situation. And they're uti- u- mm-hmm. utilizing them on Dynamite a little bit as well. So that's cool to see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're using them, using them as uh, ragdolls. Well, I mean, for at least a couple people. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wh- well, I mean, we are getting the question occasionally is, is this indie person going to be showcased or are they going to be an indie jobber guy? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's the question. Uh, we got a couple In, indie per, indie people. job indie jobber guy. <laughs> well, we got a couple people that showcase their talent. We'll get there. Uh, first, so it's uh, still two empty arena shows this time. However, we are in Georgia. At uh, we are Q- in Georgia at QT Marshall's training school. Yeah, and a much smaller ring. It is a smaller ring. It's a smaller venue. I think it makes everything yeah. look tighter and nicer. Yes, I agree. You know, it, but it, it definitely is a um, something that the wrestlers have to acclimate to. I I think it does throw their uh, game off a little mm-hmm. bit because um, they don't have uh, the ability for momentum. Uh, you know, when they're all using the ropes. Um, you know they're they're limited to um, throwing their guys around. You know there there's specific areas that they you know need to um, not get too too crazy in. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, I didn't notice it so much um, uh, for the epi- for this episode as I I did for the the uh, show on the eighth okay. as far as uh, the size of the ring. Um, and that's why I'm uh, it's, it stood out to me more so seeing the ring was much smaller and, and that's why I was talking about the ropes and stuff because uh, this past week uh, I, I rewatched the matches mm-hmm. and I, and I could see that um it definitely changed their game a little bit when it came to um, utilizing the ropes. So it was, it was, I liked what rewatching these matches too, because a lot of them go, they, they, they kind of go faster. I think they feel faster to me. Uh, there's more stuff to watch because you're, you're in a m- much more smaller ring mm-hmm. and you don't have the distraction of the audience. You don't have other things going on all around the ring that I tend to look at. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so when I'm watching these matches, rewatching the matches again, um, I, I enjoy them a second time. It's been a lot of fun, actually. Wow. Yeah. Well, our first match of the night was Kenny Omega defeating Trent of the Best Friends in a 20-minute match. Uh, Won a long time, but I incredibly enjoyed this. Uh, It's a Kenny Omega match. Um, This is what I this is what I like about AEW is, and this is kind of going back to our Bret Hart Owen Hart type match setup is you're trying to get. You're trying to create the sense of competition, right? Mm-hmm. And occasionally you'll get, you know, a 50, if I'm making a basketball reference here, occasionally you'll get the 40, 40 point blowout win, right? Yeah. But most of the time, these are professional athletes, right? Right. Up until the fourth quarter, 
usually you're going to have a back and forth affair. Right. And that's what this felt like. It felt like uh, they're trading points back and forth. uh, The occasional, you know, lead here and there. And then when the fourth quarter finally hit, Kenny Omega hit his big moves and got the win. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I really like this match. They they were going. They went the distance. Yeah, you thought they were going to go to a time limit draw, and just as there was uh, mm-hmm. one minute left, bang! One wing angel for the win. There was a scary yeah. spot here where Trent did a uh, like a throw um, German suplex spot, and Kenny Omega mm-hmm. flips over and lands like right on his busted, busted hurting shoulder. Right. Pretty wild. Kenny is working well, through all these injuries right now. Well, and then he he can't get his uh, um, his uh, wrist and finger treated, a- acupuncture stuff. You uh-huh. know that he, he is a, the cupping yeah. that he has has done, and um, yeah, and he wasn't even uh, utilizing any of his uh, tape that he normally did for his shoulder. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and what was it? Uh, I want to say last month he had a big mark, you know, some big marks when he had his cupping done for his shoulder and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, with Trent going after Omega's broken uh, hand. And, um, but then, uh, you know, Omega fights back and throws Trent into the post, you know, and that freaking had to hurt. <laughs> You know, and and I I loved it when, uh, and you know that that's the other thing I really like seeing is the other wrestlers or you know you only have a a, a small amount on each side you know and it was havoc seeing havoc uh, offering a wrench to Trent right yeah <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny <laughs> yeah heels on one side faces on the other just just like right. uh, before I like the setting. Yeah. This is a this is a good feeling, uh, and it creates easy feuds to be built, which we'll get to right mm-hmm. away. So Omega wins, and then the next match that followed was Hikaru Shida against uh, mm-hmm. QT Marshall's student Anna J, rookie, with two Y's. Yes, I want to say J J. A double N A J A double Y. Right. <laughs> there you go. Five minute match. And- J- <laughs> I gotta say that um, I'm a little jelly, uh, you know, from Anna's hair. It's really, it's really nice. She likes to flip her, whip her hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't didn't see her winning, but um, she was lucky to have the debut, and especially going up against Sheeta, that was cool. Um, I do think that you know uh, it was kind of a um, mismatch but again there's one of those that somebody can be thrown around for a little while you know here here's anna jj she just you know signed with the aew and she's got yeah so glad that she could um uh welcome her onto the (laughs) welcome her onto the mat kick the shit out of her i think this was her big tryout (laughs) and uh she (laughs) she impressed enough to gain that contract. So good for her. Well, and she had some sho- shoulder surgery and has been out oh. uh, for a year. Oh. Uh-huh. How about that? Uh-huh. Well. So um, for her to come in, you know, and uh, so she's healed. But, um, you know, we'll see how she does. See she's got does. some got some big players to uh go up against you know and um she's got news to pay <laughs> she 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 has improvements to be made but the uh the big thing yes. i want to talk about was after the match she does kind of celebrating baker's kind of brit baker's ringside and kind of mocking her yeah and uh she's eating a sandwich and she's like ah your match was whatever and she does like kind of insulted like kicks the guardrail to the side Right. You know, at her. And then, uh, I don't know if you caught this, but that's when Baker screams at her, six feet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's really funny. I died. <laughs> Love it. She's become 
become she's become such a good heel. Oh yeah, um, didn't like her in the beginning, but um, <laughs> this coming week's match was was uh, put me on the, put me on her side. Uh, I'm, I'm, li- I, I'm liking her a little I don't more. Don't think now. you're alone on that one. Yeah. Uh, so we get a small video package she, she after did that. Good. <laughs> small video package after that of MMA fighter Jake Hagar, and uh, they're building to an empty arena match for the title against Moxley. Hey, fair enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I didn't know this, but um, he's still. I didn't know that he was still fighting in MMA while he's also doing AEW. Correct. Yeah, I did. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. And he's undefeated, by the way. <laughs> undefeated where? At MMA? Yeah. Who gives a shit? <laughs> Who ca- fucking cares? I well, don't Well, you care. know what I care about? This next one. Lance Archer. <laughs> Mr. Murderhawk. Oh, my God. Poor versus Marco. Tiny Marco Stunt. Marco Polo. Marco Polo. <laughs> Watch out for the polo. I mean, you want an oh in-ring debut. Oh, my God. Put him up against Marco Stunt and just have him kill him. <laughs> this was the best Squatch match in ages. I loved it so much. Yeah, Sasquatch against who? Marco. Let's see. Who could Marco Stunt be? Um, Bambi. Bambi. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sasquatch going after the little deer. Bambi. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I mean, he does a suplex in this match where he throws him corner to corner. Oh my God. I mean, and and Marcus Stein, I mean, he, he's pretty awesome to be be letting him do that to him because he got thrown around. Like he was just a piece of salad and being tossed in a bowl. Yeah. You know, he played his role. Well, Oh, he did. (laughs) Five star squash match. Uh, there was Orange Cassidy ringside, and he had a uh, he had a sign. It was a blank white sign, so sign of the night. <laughs> Lance Archer wins, and even post match choke slams him off the apron into the best friends or the gun, which club, was perfect. Which that was great over the guardrail. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, wow. <laughs> Chucks this little dude. Well, you know, it's actually uh, you look at Lance Archer and it's and and Marco Stunt, right? So all you have to do is put Marco Stunt as a, a little ball, and it's like <laughs> shot putting him over the you know over the ring and through the through the woods, boom into the wherever to catch him. You know, oh yeah, <laughs> I was shocked, and Marco went flying. That was awesome, though. It was a it was a great match. So then after stupid th- match, but oh. great. <laughs> after this, we got conference room time with Brody Lee of the Dark Order, the Exalted One. Mm-hmm. So last we left off, he was uh, mocking Vincent Kennedy McMahon of WWE, eating a steak very ferociously. You're not allowed to interrupt his steak eating time. You're not allowed to eat until he's finished eating. <laughs> now we're into right. conference room was time. Was he a freaking king? I mean, yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's the exalted he's one. The exalted one. He is the leader that will not be disobeyed. Uh, so whatever. He's talking, talking, talking in the conference room, and then he freaks out and throws a glass against the wall because he's so disappointed in his in his minions because they mm-hmm. suck. Yeah, they do. Uh. He demands to be called Mr. Brody, and that becomes a thing as everyone's now referring to him as Mr. Brody. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. One guy, one guy yawns in his presence, and he goes, "That's weakness. That shows how weak you are. No more yawning in my presence." <laughs> Again, the, the the these are uh, these are jabs at Vince McMahon for his psychotic kind of behavior. Uh huh. Sure. And. Uh, I remember watching like episodes of The Sopranos or The Wire or Goodfellas or what you know any sort of uh, mob boss movie or TV show, and mm-hmm. these are also things mob bosses will do. Like you, you just have a uh, a simple comment, you mean nothing, uh, nothing to it, and 
the boss will just freak the fuck out. You know, like, right. stab your finger or throw throw you against the wall, bash your head in. And then he just, like, fixes his suit and he just goes, all right, let that be a lesson to you guys. Everyone's like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> That's what all this came across to me, uh, along Mm -hmm, with the mm -hmm. Vince McMahon parody. Yeah. Which, you know, to be honest, he is a psycho mob boss type guy. Well, shit, yeah. So it's, it's taking, it's taking aspects of his psycho personality and kind of make it into this mob boss feel. That's what I'm taking from it. Are are you, or is this all Vince McMahon parody? Mm -hmm. Mm No. No. And, and, uh, you know, um, at this point in time, I'm really not feeling the Brody thing and being the exalted one. I'm not, I'm just not feeling it. There's something missing. There's something that, um, isn't complete with it because right now, uh, the dark order is pretty worthless well, uh, <laughs> I think that's the story being told because he's saying that he's calling him. Yeah. Every, uh, he's calling him all but weak. I'm and... not feeling him. I I don't feel him as somebody who ha- is powerful. I'm. I, there's something missing. Uh, I can't put my finger on it, but um, you know, watching it last week and watching it this week, um, I'm just there's something missing. And, you know, telling everybody you're worthless and you're all that. Well, we already know that. They've yeah. been worthless for a while. Um, you know, um, I just, I just, th- there's just something missing for me right now. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not feeling it. Not feeling this exalted one. I call I call bullshit. He's mm-hmm. worthless to me. He's worthless to me. Well, just to cut to uh, his squash match that happened the next week where he beat some guy named Lee Johnson in a minute and a half. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Not as effective. I don't want to go there. Well, no, since we're on the topic. uh, Okay. And then we can just skip it when we get get there. Uh, (laughs) If his squash matches or his, like, big finishing move was more effective to get Mm -hmm. his character across more... Because mm-hmm. I think that's what's missing for me as well. Mm-hmm. Like you said, there's something missing in him feeling mm-hmm. like a threat, right? Right. Because yeah. right, right now he just yeah. comes across as this crazy boss guy. Right. But the difference between another company and AEW is it's a slow build. And we can see the build through these mm-hmm. little vignette and packages. Yeah. So the benefit of the doubt is they're leading to something big, right? Brody, Mr. Brody Lee is going to do something to make him uh, convince you he's a threat. Mm, okay. Well, then, then he would have to beat Lance Archer or somebody. Somebody. Bigger than him. Well, they announced, but- the, um, they announced the TNT title tournament. Uh, a second title, and I'm glad he's not in it because then that frees him up to do something more, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so Natural Nightmares, Dustin Rhodes, QT Marshall against Dark Order members eight and nine. They get numbers, <laughs> and uh, they they get beat pretty easily. Uh, Post match, Brody Lee comes out and power bombs the one that lost uh, because he showed weakness. Right. And, you know, it, it looked more like a pity match. <laughs> I was just like, because the minions of the, the Dark Order were looked really small and stupid. I think, well, I mean, Dustin They're, Rhodes is kind of a big dude, but. Um, well, yeah, but. I'd they, rather I mean, Brody Lee just, has that power bomb as the finisher instead of his little twisting clothesline that he does. Mm hmm. Because then he could just chuck someone down on the mat real hard at the very least. Yeah. I, this one, this match kind of, it, it was like a fill-in match. Yeah, was, that's exactly what it was. It was supposed to get yeah. get the point of the cross that you're, you of the Dark Order are not supposed to lose anymore. Uh-huh. And then Tony Schiavone informs us that both Chris Jericho and Broken Matt Hardy has sent them footage, and the AEW team has taken its time to make a 
promotional package between the two videos. So it makes sense mm -hmm. why they're uh, recording and there's two different perspectives of cameras, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in fact, the first one this week is of Jericho and he's in his hot tub <laughs> drinking the bubbly. Talking about talking and, about and Matt his Hardy, leather pants, full leather pants in his in his hot tub. He right. pours he pours bubbly that. in a glass. Then he puts the glass to the side and drinks out the bottle. <laughs> there are so right. many like little details that just made me die laughing. Uh, are you okay? Uh, what was that? I had that? to kill the bug. I had to kill the bug that was on the table. Jeez, well, what bug was, was gonna it? Get me. It's a big Sorry. tarantula or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's dead. That's all that okay. matters, isn't it? <laughs> so as he's as he's talking about the elite and being losers, Vanguard One, the drone, is coming up from the the lakeside. And comes up behind him, <laughs> and he's trying to convince the drone to join him again. <laughs> and he even gives him a little T-shirt with a hanger that hangs off the drone, which is hysterical. So good. <laughs> That was so funny. Then the that drone, was so good. then the drone flies away, and he throws the bottle of champagne at it, trying to hit it. You son of a bitch, Vanguard One! He yells, <laughs> "Release the hounds!" Because he just has hounds ready to go at a moment's notice, and they're just like these little shit kicker dogs. <laughs> after, like two don't even move, and another, another, the other two like run after the drone. It's really funny. Right. I. Loved it. Released the hounds. It was so good. I loved every moment of this. Oh, yeah. And did you see the hounds? One was a freaking chihuahua. Yeah. Really? It's great. <laughs> what does he have, like, four dogs or four some five, shit yeah. like that? Yeah. Jesus. This was really, it, it was hysterical. <laughs> and then under his breath, you know, when everything's all said, he's like, son of a bitch, stole my t-shirt. <laughs> right. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> And then our main event, uh, getting us ready for the TNT title match tournament. It is yep. Sean Spears and Sammy Guevara teaming up against Cody and Darby Allen, your man and yeah. my man. Mm -hmm. uh, Sammy and and Sean Spears have a bet in middle of the match who can hold the guy up for a suplex the longest. Right. They keep throwing money down, and <laughs> Sean Spears loses another bet, just like he did uh, last week in the uh, in the back room. Right. He got chased out, so. Someone needs to get a, like a count on how much money Sean Spears has lost. <laughs> All the gambling and rest wrestling. Right. It's really funny. We'll never know. Yeah. Maybe that's why we haven't seen Tully Blanchard in a while because he keeps losing money and he can't pay him. <laughs> <laughs> right. I thought this was I thought this was a good matchup though. Yeah, it went 22 minutes. Uh, I thought it was a little it, little on the long side, but it it really got its point across. Yeah. I I loved it with Guevara when he got his phone taken away. Because <laughs> he was videotaping. Yeah, he was vlogging mid match. <laughs> yeah, or whatever he was doing. <laughs> and then uh, uh, Cody's wife grabbed it, right? Yeah. yeah. She ran away with his phone. <laughs> My favorite point in the match was when I believe it was Sean Spears throws Cody over the guardrail on the heel side. Then all the heels start beating his ass. Havoc has uh -huh. Havoc has like a, a he has the wrench. <laughs> Britt Baker starts beating her up with the shoe because earlier she threw a shoe oh, at yeah, Sheeta, yeah. and she's yeah. whacking him, whacking him, whacking him, sandwich in the other hand. Then she, the camera's like behind her, yeah. and she turns around the camera. She's got like food in her mouth. She screams oh. at it, ah, and starts going back to beating Cody <laughs> with the shoe. <laughs> Well, you, have you noticed that uh, this this time, uh, Sammy Sammy's getting sparkly. He's getting more flashy with his sparkly knee pads and his panties. And well, he's his, got to show off to his, all the ladies. He is a Spanish yeah, god, after and, all. And, a, and his hair goo. Hair <laughs> think, goo. Yeah, he's got hair goo. Oh man, make it stand up through all the stuff. Ew. Somebody's gonna get hurt from his hair. Yeah. So, uh, in the, uh, I mean, Darby Allen does a coffin drop, monkeying up this pillar in the middle of the building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was cool. Uh, so Spears introduces a chair because he's the chairman. Uh, Darby ends up eating the pin by Spears after saving Cody from the chair shot, punches Cody in frustration, setting up 
the TNT title tournament very nicely, adds an element to the story. Now, yeah. the people involved in the TNT tournament at this point are Sean Spears versus Cody on the left side, along with Sammy Guevara and Darby Allen. So the winners of those two matches will face each other in the semifinals. Mm-hmm. And on the other side of the bracket is Dustin Rhodes versus uh, Kip Sabian. Right. And then Lance Archer versus Coco Colt Cabana. Cabana. Coco Cabana, your man. Uh, yeah. So full disclosure, even before the brackets were even announced on Twitter, I had put out Lance Archer versus Cody is the finals. And I have predicted Lance will win. And then when the brackets were announced, you made your prediction of Sean Spears versus Lance Archer in the finals with Lance winning. So we both have Lance Archer winning. Uh, yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. yeah. But um, back to the uh, Darby Allen match, you didn't talk about Darby. Darby was awesome in this match. Well, he's an awesome guy. He is. I, I loved it when he when he climbed the pole. That was so cool. I did mention that. Huh? I did mention that. You did mention that? I did. Well, how did I miss it? Well, you need to listen to me. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> God, I gotta but do I that? I don't listen to you. <laughs> but I like that Darby decked Cody for not winning. It's a good element uh, introduced. Mm-hmm. So, um, mm-hmm. Darby versus Cody 3 in the TNT title tournament. A lot of people have Darby winning uh, into the finals and winning the title. Which wouldn't be the worst choice in the world. Archer? I can see uh, Archer kind of interfering with Mr. Caesar that that Jake Roberts Mm -hmm. has been calling Cody, costing him the match, and then that leads to Darby (laughs) Allen winning against Lance Archer. Ah, oh, you know some ah, sort of shenanigans ah, happening. Uh huh. Yeah. But this is AEW; they kind of don't do yeah. that very often. Mm-hmm. So who knows? Mm. April eighth, Dynamite number twenty-seven. Da, 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 da. Lance, uh, well, we we start out with Jake Roberts doing a promo, uh, talking about Caesar, all that stuff. Very good stuff. Very ominous. Love that Chris Jericho was commentator. He is freaking great. Hysterical all night with Tony Schiavone. You know, he's got a job once he stops uh, wrestling because he would make a great commentator. Have you ever listened to his podcast? No. Yeah. Talk is Jericho. Uh, Look it up. He does interviews with Matt Hardy, uh, Brody Lee, a bunch of other guys. Moxley. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, I will. Uh, Lance Archer kills Alan Angels. Not as good as the Marco stunt match, but no, effective for me I nonetheless. Did, I, I I do like uh, Lan- Lance Archer's red braids. <laughs> Beautiful flowing <laughs> hair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Again, I thought this was. A st- <laughs> A sad match for the poor guy. <laughs> poor guy died. Everybody dies. Yeah, everybody dies. <laughs> right? But see, he has more uh, dominant presence than Brody. See, I was kind of hoping Lance Archer was going to be the exalted one. But Brody Lee is a better promo, so I think the character that they're going for and the story mm. they want to tell is more for Brody Lee's character. Well, even still, Archer to me has more uh, dominant presence than well, sure, yeah, Brody Lee at this time. At this so, time, oh, for sure, I don't yeah, disagree with that. At this time, Hikaru Shida defeats Britt Baker in a 17-minute match. This Arguably, has to be one of my favorite matches against women and i hate women matches but this was awesome this was great arguably one of the best AEW women's matches to date yeah yeah it was it was bloody good (laughs) well it was definitely bloody (laughs) it was bloody good the match was i'm glad i got to watch it a second time to see when she got uh the bloody nose well do tell 
Well, she got the bloody nose, actually. So I think her first hit in the face was uh, when she w- was uh, hanging on the gate. Uh-huh. And then uh, Sheeta actually elbowed her in the face a, uh, a Brit, and that's what started uh, the gushing of the nosebleed because Sheeta elbowed her. Um, and it was... Um, maybe you know a a minute later or so so she already had the one jar and then um she had a really elbowed her bad in the face and it it caught caught her nose and it that was just the end of it after that yeah match was a bit of a cluster but it was an awesome cluster i I, it was a lot of fun it was um uh i was actually um pleasantly uh, finally seen Britt Baker actually uh, do some wrestling that she looked a little more um, together Mm -hmm. than she has in the past. Oh, I agree. So yeah. And this was, this was a big breakout performance from her. Yeah, I think so too. Um, It was a, it was a good matchup between the two and, um, uh, finally getting to see some things out of Brit that we haven't seen before. And, uh, and I liked Sheeta. I was, I was, I liked this match. It was a good match. I'm, yep. I'm very happy. It's uh this is, this is the benefit of women's wrestling uh, at a, at a good point. Uh, no shock. Mm-hmm. Hikaru Shida uh, re- maintains the number one contender for, I think 10 weeks now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's no shock she's got two weeks in a row. She got a great match out of uh, young, young, inexperienced wrestlers, mm-hmm. and made them mm-hmm. look very good. So some ta- mm-hmm. some some fantastic visuals coming out of this one, including uh, Baker getting her nose busted and bleeding like a faucet, uh, to right. her smiling and embracing it. And uh, we even get a good post match <laughs> promo from Baker later that was equally as good, calling Sheeta right. dirty. Uh, this is not how you treat a role model. <laughs> Uh, it just goes off. She's smiling at the camera with the blood, like her makeup's just a total mess. Her hair's all messed up. The bloody face. It was fantastic. Uh, this I believe is there. There was blood all over the mat. Oh yeah, and on on Sheeta and that. Oh my god, she was one bloody mess. So this is, I believe, their third encounter together. Their second singles match together. It's become a great rivalry. Yeah, uh, commentary was really getting into it. Jericho liked it. He even saved like yeah. a couple of the cluster botches that happened or the yeah. misses. Like Sheeta goes for an insiguri and it ex- and it- Baker kind of ducks, so Sheeta hits mm-hmm. her side. Mm-hmm. It- yeah, not really what they were going for. And Jericho, Jericho's comment was, "Ah, she got her in the kidneys. I think she was going for the head, but she had to adjust." And there's plenty of fighters that we've known just takes that one kidney shot and they go down. <laughs> I'm like, damn. Yeah, he's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It was, it was, it was great. So yeah, they were trying to joke around a lot and have fun with it. But there was, there was moments like that where I was like, man, this commentary is really good. Yeah. Uh, so the story of Baker continues, where she still can't beat the Josie Joshi uh, women in one one on one matches. So mm-hmm. she's lost to Riho a number of times. Shida now right. twice. Yuka Sakazaki once. Can't beat the uh, the 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 Japanese women. Right. Or that style. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, really good match. Omega and Nakazawa are in a trailer and they're talking about teaming tonight. And uh so Nakazawa's like we need a team name. Omega's like, "Okay, <laughs> what are we going to be called?" Nakazawa's like, "The best friends." It's like, "Well, that <laughs> name's already taken. We can't do that." And he goes, "Well, you're the executive vice president." And we're actually best friends. Just just do it. Omega's like, I don't know, man. <laughs> That's when Orange Cassidy comes out of their bathroom randomly. Right. And then opens the, opens the door. And the Great. best friends walk in. They're like, we heard it all. <laughs> and Omega's like, ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so Chuck's like, you think you're better best friends than us? Yeah. We're real best friends. You can't have that. Uh-huh. Fine. We'll put the name on the line tonight. <laughs> I was like, this is so ridiculous. They walk out of the trailer all angry. And Omega's like, I'm getting too old for this shit. (laughs) So funny. It was so corny, and I loved it. 
Then they have a match, and it was something straight out of DDT. There's a bunch of uh, falling into the crotch spots. Nakazawa's got his baby oil. Uh, really goofy stuff. All comedy. It was it was a good break in everything being taken so seriously, especially even coming after the Sheeta Baker match, where right. it was a bloody fight. Yeah, yeah. And this one was just comedy. It was so funny. It had a funny little story to it. Uh, I liked it. I could see I people. I loved the dong thong. Oh God. The dong thong in the face. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> what the hell? You're like, what the hell is he doing? Oh, no. Oh, that was so awful. Well, it was so awful good. <laughs> people didn't like the com- A lot of people didn't like the comedy. It was a little over the top, but uh, <laughs> it's Nakazawa. It was great. <laughs> right. And exactly. It was Nakazawa for sure. And, um, he did ads, you know, with the oil and, and, um, making Trent hit him and he, and he just slides off from the the chest, you know, he can't slap him, you know, it's just sliding. And, uh, I thought they were going to do more sliding. (laughs) Right. There, I mean, you'll see these kind of comedy matches in every single promotion out there. It's, you know, if you don't like it, fine. It's only one match. Who cares? Right. Lighten up. Yeah. Get a life. Mr. What else you? Hey, what, what, what the hell? Why do you have to be so serious with all this shit going on right now? Got to have some fun. I like your you perspective. Know? I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Needless to say, the best friends win and Nakazawa loses. <laughs> he, yeah, he loses his dong thong yeah. and everything. Brody Lee meets with his minions <laughs> outside. He's running oh he's running two of the geeks down for not dressing properly. You know, their loose mm-hmm. clothes showing off their man titties, and then one mm-hmm. has a suit. He's trying at least. Right. He's here to make their <laughs> lives extraordinary. Give them success. Says, get your acts together, and then he has an opportunity for the one with the suit. So a little Vince McMahon parody again, but making him mm-hmm. you know, again, it's just like any other Yakuza mob boss situation. Mm-hmm. You don't dress properly. You don't deserve to be in my presence. You've got to dress for success, right? Uh, the Vince McMahon parody part is he wants all of his wrestlers to always be in suits all the time. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, it's psychotic, well, right? What is he, a freaking dictator? Yes. Wow. He's a mob boss. <laughs> wow, mob boss, yeah. yeah. Matt Hardy video pro- promo this time. This is part two of that uh, sending into AEW, and they made it. Uh, Matt Hardy's at his compound. He's mocking Jericho for hot tubbing in leather pants. Hole of ass. Hole of the ass. <laughs> Calls Sammy a fake god and a fraud Latino. Because he's, well, we know because he's from Katy, right. Texas. <laughs> he runs down Santana Ortiz as snacks he wants to eat. Because he loves Puerto Rican food, and he chomps his teeth. <laughs> it's crazy. Jericho will never recruit Vanguard One, who arrives, has Hardy, he has uh, the t-shirt, and then he, uh, the circle of inners, or whatever he calls it, <laughs> lights the shirt on fire, and then he the offers... Of circles. <laughs> yeah, he offers uh, Jericho a fight at the compound for elite deletion. Right. So we'll get our own graveyard delete, boneyard match delete. thing. Delete, elite. Yeah, it's, I love Matt Hardy. He's so good. He over is. the top, over the top personality. Uh huh. <laughs> Brody Lee defeats he looks, Lee Johnson. He looks like a Harry. Po- he looks. He reminds me of a little bit of a Harry Potter character. Very, very possible. Absolutely. <laughs> right. All he needs is his wand. Yeah. Brody Lee defeats Lee Johnson. We already talked about all that. Uh, right. There were two video packages on the night, uh, each interviewing Hager and Moxley for their big title fight, uh, as it's being advertised for next week, I believe. Yes. Uh, Hager is MMA training. Moxley is talking about this won't be a match. This will be a fight. Uh, yep. I think the video packages did their job. There was a, a moment where Hager's wife was interviewed, and she's coming, off, she's coming across as the trophy wife situation. Mm-hmm. If he loses, he might as well not even come home. <laughs> No, he no. If he loses, he just won't come home. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm locking the door. Because we're no, we're we're a winning family, and oh. 
And if he doesn't win, he just doesn't come home. Well, I guess he's not coming home then. <laughs> right? We could only hope. Yeah. Oh, hell. I want Hager to get the shit beat out of him. Well, there you go. That's the point, right? Yeah. I think I think they've built him up well enough. Uh, and Moxley is going to beat a tough guy, quote unquote. A big, do- big guy. And uh, just something to do in between getting ready for a bigger match. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Right. And then the first match, first round match of our TNT title tournament, Mr. American Nightmare neck tattoo Cody Rhodes against Sean Spears. <laughs> match goes 21 and a half minutes. That think? was a crazy match, but a good match. I really liked it. Jericho didn't like Spears' sparkly scarf. He did not. And then, ooh, Cody's breakaway shirt. Ooh. Wow, that was impressive. That was, and and no one to throw it to. No, well, he threw it to his wife. <laughs> no, not the shirt. Oh no, but the he belt. Threw, he did. No, the belt went to um, uh, who was that? I forget. He actually, someone else threw, caught the belt. I thought. Oh, maybe it was the belt last week. He got brandy, but anyway. Yeah, I think so. But uh, Jericho does not like <laughs> does not like. Cody's tattoo at all. He goes that he thinks that the, the tattoo artist was drunk <laughs> and that, and that he tried to copy. You see that thing on his pants. He was saying this in the commentary, you see the thing on the back of his pants. That's what the, the tattoo artist tried to copy, but he was so drunk. He came up with that stupid thing. <laughs> it was great. Jericho. It was so funny oh my all God, night. He was he oh I I hope he continues to uh be commentary for a while because he's just been a um it's been a lot of fun listening to him. You know, we saw him a little bit when he was on the boat and got, yeah, got yeah. you know uh some insight into him uh doing commentary, but not knowing now that I do know that you know he's got a um what is it, a YouTube? Podcast. Podcast, okay. So I got to listen to that because I bet that's really good too. Because he even said, you know, because <laughs> Shivani goes, what, what, you got anger issues. And he goes, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just hyper. I, I've got. <laughs> just excited. <laughs> just a really excited, excitable person. <laughs> I'm animated. He says, I'm an animated person in general. And yeah, I, you know, I was kissing babies and doing whatever he said. <laughs> oh yeah. Back in 1997, I was, I was shaking hands and kissing babies. But then in 1998, I found my way. I said, screw the fans. I'm going to start shaking babies and kissing hands. <laughs> that's when I took off. I was like, oh my God, it's so good. So Cody Rhodes and Sean Spears beat the hell out of each other. Aubrey Edwards, the ref, re- let a lot go by and uh, commentary did a good job. Uh, making it come across that you know it's it's a uh, tournament match, gonna let a lot, gonna let everything slide. We're not gonna you know throw the match out or anything unless it gets to a right, certain point. Right, because you know in in actuality, you know bringing out the um, table and the guardrail, then the guardrail yeah. and uh, yeah, and then and then uh, Jerica says he doesn't like Aubrey. Yeah, right. <laughs> He doesn't. He doesn't like her telling him what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Shivani goes. Well, uh, that's what refs are supposed to do. Well, I don't like her anyways. She doesn't have to tell me what to do. Yeah. I know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody tells me what to do. And then he goes. You know, when he was introduced uh, at the beginning, he goes. You know, I'm here with Chris Jericho. He goes. No, la champion to you. You <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> Ski of own all night. Yeah. So Spears ends up using the table, uh, doing a, uh, uh, I guess, DVD over the top situation. Mm-hmm. Cody crashes and burns through the table. Uh, Spears gets on the advantage. Uh, there's a lot of beatdowns. It, it, it was a really good match, and uh, Cody does hit. This was cool. So Cody hits two crossroads as he gains the momentum back, right? Gains control. Right. Right. And this tells a story in itself. So, remember the goofy match with Kip Sabian, where he got so mad and he hit three crossroads on Sabian to win? Yeah. Okay. 
Cut then to Revolution against MJF, where he hit two, and then he went for the third, and that's what cost him the match, because MJF ended up beating him off it. So then mm-hmm. this time, he hit two, and immediately went for the pin. Spears kicked out of this one. So there was mm-hmm. a there was a, a story just in that moment in itself, which I thought was really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, so instead of like trying to go for that third one, he went for the figure four, which he won a couple weeks ago with. Remember? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the, and uh, he ends up pinning Spears off the figure four, mm-hmm. which was pretty crazy because Ric Flair used to do that a little bit of back in the well, day. Well, so. from what Jericho said, I'm not. I don't know if that's true or not, but he said uh, actually the figure four was made famous by Ric Flair. Well, yeah. Or Buddy Roger? Nah, I'm not sure. I know there was someone before Ric Flair, but to, who made it famous and worldwide. Yeah, it was Ric Flair. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! So, Cody does end up winning. A good finish, good match. Uh, it hopefully was. it's Hopefully it's, you know. I, I, was, I was honestly surprised that Spears didn't win. I think he should have won. I think there was... Um, well, how can he be a loser of... Cody if he doesn't lose? <laughs> I, I, well, and he won, and he shouldn't have won. <laughs> he should have lost. I was very disappointed. <laughs> I wanted Spears. I wanted Spears to um, go to the next uh, level. Yeah. Yeah, the next round. Well, I mean, he was in back-to-back nights of the main events. Uh, got his little limelight there. Uh, he's not a main eventer. He's definitely a mid-card guy. Uh-huh. Um, I see. Okay, well, that... The, yeah, okay. But I still felt that the match was heavy spears. I mean, he was throwing... You know, he was doing some damage on Cody. Well, then it got its point across, especially with the win the previous week. Uh, got, mm-hmm. you know, something on his side going. Got elevated him to a different level, and... Uh, Took it to Cody, kind of play. They they even played packages of their of their rivalry uh, from 2019, from mm-hmm. the chair shot uh, to their match at All Out. I believe that's when it took place. So fun, fun two nights. Uh, they pre-taped about six weeks ahead, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, through mid May. So they're mm-hmm. set for a while at this venue. I'm very okay with it. Uh, as long as they get to keep the wrestlers ringside, that's a that's a winning formula in my eyes. Right, right, yeah, and uh, and I'm I'm assuming that it's all going to be at QT Marshall's place. Yes. For now. Yeah, that's yeah. where they all taped. Is my okay. understanding. Yeah. And I had asked Dad if he's watched any AEW, and he said he checked it out the other night. Mm-hmm. And he didn't realize what he was watching, so uh, perhaps I can get his opinion. If he watches next week's episode. Well, there you go. See well, yeah, I mean, he's got he's got TNT. You know, yeah. I don't. He has he still um, has cable in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> Bastards aren't going to get my money. All right, Mom. You have any star matches and your favorite wrestler of the two weeks? So. So. I have for um, the 4-1 uh, episode, mm-hmm. I liked the Kenny Omega versus Trent. Got four stars from me. Ooh. And also the Spears Guevara, Darby Allen Cody got four stars from me. Wow, the main event. That week. Yes, the main event. And then for the uh, last week's show, again, I went with the um, best friends, Nakazawa Omega, got four stars for me for that. Oh, wow, the comedy match. (laughs) Yes, I really enjoyed that match. And um, actually, my star for both is actually going to be the woman and it's Britt baker Britt baker gets on the list hell yeah. yes yeah wow a lot of a lot of good wrestling uh that you enjoyed the past two weeks i did Mom. yes 
and I have been enjoying it. Um, it's going to be, what's going to be strange is when, you know, everything starts, uh, getting back to a normal, new again. normal. Yeah. And, so, um, I'll, I'll interrupt you here. I was actually thinking of this and this goes for a lot of promotions too. All of them. In fact, yeah. Yeah. so, uh, sp- more so with WWE and AEW because they're still running shows on a weekly basis mm-hmm. taped or not. Mm-hmm. When the fans return, it's going to be extremely interesting to see their re- see and hear their reactions to people coming out, gimmicks that are over or not, and because like Hardy and Brody are new, and so is Lance Archer to an extent as well mm-hmm, with everything mm-hmm. they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that goes for WWE coming after Corona Mania. And mm-hmm. all they're building, they're doing all their stories to to see the crowd reactions, who's over, who's not, what they like and what they don't like after all these weeks of building and absence. Mm-hmm. That's going to that's going to be super interesting to me. Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, how we're watching it right now, um, we're only, you know, we've got our walls around us and. And then we have the TV and there's walls around that right. basically, right. you know, and you only have that strip of audience, which is the other wrestlers basically. Yeah. Or, or you can only have so many people in there, you know? Um, so it'll be really interesting to, um, see how people are after all of this and how they're uh they're i'm i'll tell you one thing they're gonna freaking go crazy what's the other thing out of their minds so so are the fans are the fans for that first week are are going to explode to everything explode to everything because they've been muted for so long you know you're talking months of mute Right. And that's very hard on the psyche in, in itself. And to finally be to let you know, loose. To let loose and to you're they're just gonna go insane, crazy, happy. And just it's gonna be a mayhem at its best. Controlled mayhem, I'll say. It's gonna be exciting. But it's gonna be exciting. And I can't wait. Because <laughs> I have an AEW event to go to, damn it. And it was supposed to happen, uh, I think. Two weeks from now? The 27th I was supposed to go. Yeah. I was supposed to go uh, this Wednesday coming up. Yeah. And then, right. No, I was supposed to go to the 29th show. Because it was the first time it's been in Houston. Yeah. So I was going to go to the 29th show. Now, now I, I don't go until November. Yeah. I'm August. Ah, <laughs> uh, no shit. Yeah. See, I gotta wait till freaking November. Boo. Yeah, I'm really sad. Oh well. I'm boo boo boo. I was right. so excited about seeing it this month, and yay! And then <laughs> went. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining me for another fun episode, Mom. Hey, thanks for having me. I'll see you in Lots two of weeks. Fun. You betcha. Bye. Bye. Alrighty, I'm back going solo. Get me a little clock going here. Uh, trying something a little different with the audio this time, a little experiment, but I hope you guys enjoy nonetheless. Uh, time to, you know what? Before I start with Ice Ribbon and the uh, very one sided Joshi War these days, because Ice Ribbon is still running shows, uh, empty arena or not, uh, as I fight my cat, I battle him. Mortal Kombat to these days. Being Sid Vicious over here. You should be Sid Justice as he... Oh. Okay. Laying in front of the computer. A nice little warm spot. I am watching him now. Bite my mic cord! Get! Get out of here! Ah! Oh, he's not budging. Oh, he's bad. 
so I did end up watching an episode of Impact. I was going to bring this up at the start of the show uh, when Mom was going, but she didn't watch Impact. I watched uh, April 7th. It's kind of their get ready big, uh, I guess, go home show angle uh, for the big rebellion show that they're running. Uh, Rebellion last year, if I recall, was a more or less TV special, and it was pretty good. It was okay. Uh, This year, they're building up to Tessa Blanchard in a triple threat match, defending her title against Michael Elgin and Eddie Edwards. And the show uh, was... I I saw the... um, advertised match for the main event which was tessa and eddie going for the tag titles uh along with their whole stipulation building to can they get along uh against the north and i'm a big fan of the north they're one of the best tag teams around despite my uh lame hatred for ethan page uh he's kind of growing on me kitty why why must you every podcast it's either mom's cats or you okay chill next to me be better. Be good. Be Sid Justice. Yes, per away. So yeah, uh, I ended up watching the entire show. I uh, had some interesting angles going on. Uh, little different stories, a little campy at times. The ECW guys are still running rampant on the show, uh, much like it was 2003 and four all over again. Uh, but skipping to the main event, uh, Tessa Blanchard is a very very good wrestler. Uh, she's got the character down pat. She's got the poise. When she, that hot tag when she got in the ring was among the best hot tags I've seen in wrestling in 2020. It was that good. The fire. Uh, there, there's a really cool moment actually where she's going up against Josh Alexander, and you know he's he's big brooding uh, wrestler guy. I, I've seen him live. He's very good to watch live. Uh, So she goes for a clothesline, and because she's much smaller than him, she fails the first time to get him over the top rope into the floor. So he cockily, uh, I don't know if it was a botch or not, but we ended up telling a pretty good story here, where he pushes her off all cockily. He's like, ah, you're small, you can't do this to me. She tries one more time, he laughs it off again, and then she fires up, punches punches or slaps him in the face, and then the clothesline gets him over. It It was pretty good. Very simple, uh, nice little ring psychology and storytelling there uh, for the bigger picture. And it just goes very much like that with a high-octane offense on both sides, a very 50-50 matchup. And the other sides of the story is Michael Elgin kind of played this reverse psychology game on the North because they're all heels, so that worked out. And then commentary is really, really putting it over that Blanchard... Tet trusts no one because of the whole issue with Sammy Callahan and his his side of the story. I don't know what happened to Callahan on uh, in between Rebellion and him kind of doing this uh, weird stalker video thing, what his role is, but clearly it played a mental impact on Tessa Blanchard in trusting Eddie Edwards in this match, and as it came to a close and she wa- she, wa- she was going to give Eddie... A, uh, a finishing hot tag, well, tag, she chose against it, and that played into her own demise, and she ended up eating the pin to the tag team champions, whom, by the way, are the longest reigning Impact tag team champions. So it, it gives, this does a lot of things, I think, well, as in it built, and then Michael Elgin uh, attacked her post match, and Eddie just kind of shook his head and walked away. So, lots of good character work here. This was a slam dunk main event. I am very happy I watched this show. Uh, it actually got me very interested in Rebellion as a whole with what they're doing with uh, the knockouts division, the main event scene. Uh, they've built up a nice, solid little roster. The undercard and midcard, I definitely wasn't feeling too much, but what they what impact was lacking the last couple years was a solid main event scene with main event players with meaningful storylines building to a match you want to see, and that's something that's been lacking the last couple years. So Tessa Blanchard winning the title, I still think, is the right decision. Uh, I think Michael Elgin should pin Eddie Edwards in the main event, 
don't pin Tessa Blanchard twice situation. You want to keep her strong because it's already, I hate to say it, but intergender run, wrestling is a tricky line you got to cross. Luckily, Tessa's one of the best wrestlers on the planet, I believe, uh, with how she carries her. She carries herself like a superstar, and that's something missing in today's wrestling quite a lot. Uh, you only see that with a handful, handful of guys and girls. So... I'm very interested in watching Rebellion, and I'm going to watch it for the podcast, for sure. I will cover it. Uh, I believe it'll be a taped Empty Arena show in Tennessee somehow. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the main event and where the North goes with their tag title reign. Yeah, excellent stuff. Now on to Ice Ribbon, so just a nice little tangent there. A uh, few minutes, not bad. Uh, Ice Ribbon 1030 in Skip, uh, March 20th. Uh, it aired on Nico Pro Ice Ribbon's channel on uh, April 4th. Uh, just a quick little rundown. It was more or less a build show again. Uh, Mike Ozaki is tagging with Yappy. Uh, they defeat Bani o uh, Okawa and Satsuki Totoro. Ten minute match. Such a same Ozaki is back in the undercard on a regular basis. Uh, I know she still has a lot to learn. It has, to me, it's not so much her ring work. It's all in her character and her... Well, character look as well. That's where she's lacking. I think she has that... Uh, I think she her potential is still there. Uh, but she definitely, definitely has the ring manner to carry herself to get out of this undercard. Because that this is killing me. She's, she's one of the most underrated Joshi out there, in my opinion. Uh, there was a singles match of Tsukushi taking on Miku Aono. Uh, they go seven minutes. Basically, Miku uh, tries to fight back against a dick heel Tsukushi, uh, doing heel things and stiff kicks, uh, as she's been doing. Easy and enjoyable seven-minute match. Tsukushi wins, and now I am thinking we'll eventually get a Tsukushi Sayuri, uh, Shuri match, Sayuri, Shuri uh, singles match down the line, because Shuri is uh, still freelancing. Um, she's in Donna Del Mundo and Stardom, uh, that faction, and she's got this pseudo invasion faction a uh i wish i kept the tweet because uh when i put out uh that i thought sukushi or not sukushi uh shuri has this kind of actress girl freelancer invasion group going on and i thought it was my impression that aono is part of it and apparently she isn't it's just that she's been roped into various tag matches uh, with them. So my misunderstanding. Uh, but in my head, it's still working out in storyline that way. I have yet to see any contradiction. That being said, Tsukushi is nailing this heel role. And her being like 410 is absolutely hilarious. Because she does chicken shit heel things. And then she's stomping on fingers and hiding behind people. And like, if I'm to compare short heels... Uh, right now, Sakushi's definitely nailing the heel Joshi role, which I which I voiced that that's something definitely missing uh, in women's wrestling, uh, especially Joshi Joshi wrestling, uh, or the Joshi scene, I should say. Uh, then you have someone like Natsuko Tora in Stardom, whom doesn't come across as a heel at all, and yet she's in this rambunctious heel group and supposedly the leader. Uh, until I'm proven otherwise, I don't. I'm not buying it. <laughs> but anyways, the next two matches I really loved. Uh, the match of the night was definitely this one: the Matsuya Uno, Shuri, and Tehonma, your freelancer invasion group, uh, taking on and defeating the home team of Hiragi Kurumi, Ibuki Hoshi, and Sukasa Fujimoto in a just under 20 minute match. Shuri and the Joint Army, as they're called. Uh, they're continuing their taking overness of Ice Ribbon. Uh, there was a lot of comedy in this match, especially at the beginning. Uh, a little bit too much, in my opinion, for something you're trying to get across as a serious storyline. You can still have your comedy spots, uh, but I think that's... Maybe that played into the story, and I'm reading it wrong, uh, but it seemed like the Ice Ribbon team wasn't taking the match as seriously as they should, and that's why they got beaten in the end. Uh, but Shuri definitely and easily the standout here, basically on the entire show. 
Tehon also looked real good. Uh, Karumi uh, looking very solid coming off her big singles match loss to Maya. And uh, even pulling off this absurd four people on her back into a splash spot. Where she takes them all on the corner and then holds them up for a second and then lands. Very cool. Uh, Shuri gets the f gets the win with the knee down sharpshooter to Ibuki Hoshi. So I think if someone was to eat the pin, it should definitely be the, I guess, 16 year old. <laughs> so very entertaining match. Uh, Shuri, in my opinion, is the fastest rising star in Japan at this moment. Uh, with her work in Stardom and Ice Ribbon, I can't really pinpoint anyone who's rising faster in this vacuum moment of the coronavirus period. Uh, main event, Mayukihi teaming with Rom Kaicho and Rina Yamashita. They defeat the team of Mochi Miyagi, Risa Sara, and Suzu Suzuki, the one challenging Maya uh, at their next show. 15 minutes, 50 seconds this went. Uh, this match wasn't as good as the joint army match prior, but mostly highlights and sets up for future bouts. So, you know, it served a purpose. Risa Sara and Yamashita went at each other hard, uh, with Sara looking especially motivated uh, in this match. Naturally, Suzu and Maya went through what seemed to be a practice run for their future title match, as Suzu was trying a number of new things, which is really cool to see. I always like seeing that. I don't care if you botch. If you're trying new things and it's safe, uh, and you're trying to just get a feel with it through the matches, what better way to do it in, you know, tag and, and trios matches? So, uh, she even did a feliner, uh, so that got a big pop out of me because I've been trolling online that uh, the cat three-time karate champion <laughs> uh, was doing that, you know, the, the spinning uh, front kick. So yeah, uh, she even does a standing moonsault now, so that's cool to see. Nice little repertoire added. Mochi Miyagi gets cracked in the face one good time. Uh, Bust her nose and mouth open. Good visual there. Miyagi eats the pin, getting one-legged super cradled by Maya. So Maya being the, well, cocky champions. Like, I can beat these people with whatever move. Post-match, Yamashita challenges Sarah to a special singles match. Uh, I think I heard deathmatch challenge as well. Winner gets a title shot, was my understanding, which would make sense. They are two big-time singles competitors, uh, especially after the uh, title tournament, which was uh, the fall of last year, uh, well, where those two got the closest to beating Maya. So that makes sense in, in, uh, to me. Uh, meanwhile, Mochi Miyagi uh, seemed to challenge Maya, wanting to redeem her loss uh, just now. Maya takes the mic and starts talking of her next potential challengers to be met with an angered Suzu, booting her in the literal ass and rips the mic away because, well, she's being ignored. And Maya, being a good champion, just kind of lets her have, her, have the mic. It's like, ah, you know, I kind of messed up and I was acknowledging the person that challenged me. Suzu cuts a real good promo with plenty of emotion, facial expressions, and body language. So, don't look past me. I'll figure out the weakness and overcome my age kind of thing is the promo I got from it. No doubt in my mind that 17-year-old Suzu is taking that title. Anyone who argues that you're too young for a title opportunity or to win a title or this fabled haven't paid your dues yet uh, in a promotion or you haven't been around long enough. If you're ready, you're ready. I call that all nonsense. So I put out this analogy and yes, wrestling is different because you have to learn to work safe, but imagine this. Uh, for all the football fans out there, let's use Patrick Mahomes, because he's a great example. Guy fresh out of college, gets put on the starting lineup, learns the system, he wins the starting, line, uh, the starting role, wins a Super Bowl with the team. Imagine, like, take learning the playbook as the analogy for learning to work safe and, and well, work, okay? Imagine that analogy. Now imagine if there was a scenario where fans and people are like, ha, huh, he's too young. He needs to pay his dues in the NFL for at least two or three years before he can, he can 
even be considered for a starting quarterback role. No matter how good he is, he hasn't paid his dues. He's too young. Ah, come on, he's only 21 or whatever. I don't believe in that. Uh, Just recently in WWE, Austin Theory got called up to Monday Night Raw. Do I think he isn't ready from a skill standpoint is way different than this fabled paying his dues. Oh, they called him up from NXT suit too soon. I still say if you're if if if, if the skill set is there, age does not matter. Nor does how long you've been in the business matter. If you're good, you're good. If you're a star, you're a star. Push that. In Suzu Suzuki's case, yes, she's 17. She's just coming off her rookie year. Ice Ribbon needs to build a star. They see a star immediately in Suzu Suzuki. I see a star. This is a great move uh, to, in my mind, she's winning this title. And if, and hey, if she doesn't, as long as she's not put in Ozaki's undercard role, like sh- she's going about, fine. She's 17. More than enough time. The, the real thing you got to be careful, though, is how many title losses can you take before people stop uh, paying attention and using that momentum? That's the biggest question. All right. So with that, as I mark my timestamp down, And yes, my mic is still working. I was a little worried there. It's time to talk uh, the Dragon Gate show. I'm quite excited for. Here we go. Dragon Gate! Oh. I've dropped the scotch for a little while. I'm going back to classic Bierschens. Very, very much a fan. My favorite beer. Oh, this was so depressing. A little side tangent. Uh, I've really come to love beer from Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. That whole trifecta state New England area. And one of my Ver- Vermont beers, uh, Zero Gravity, came across a liquor store, and it's like right by work. So I can just pick up a six pack on my way home uh right before the this outbreak happened i found it and it was like six dollars for a six pack holy shit what a deal i bought like 18 of them yes kitty what i'm telling a good beer story here i go back uh and now they're nine ten bucks it seems like it was a one-time deal oh but i still got it I relished in those six do- that $6 beer. It seemed like they were trying to do some promotional uh, competitive stuff. What do you want, Kitty Cat? My God, you are needy right now. Dragon Gate, Gate of Passion, April 4th from Kobe Sanbo Hall. And I really encourage right now for people to check out the Dragon Gate streaming service. Uh, I would love to talk Dragon Gate with a lot more people out there. It is my kind of promotion. This The... the Japanese luchador hybrid style uh, is very much my bread and butter. I absolutely love the style. I, it pains me that I only semi-watched or was able to watch Dragon Gate for a long time, and I didn't get really into it until the last couple of years, and that's basically when PAC got over. Because I did watch Dragon Gate in the 2010s, you know, with Dragon Gate USA and all that. Uh I was able to see it in one one for one form of fashion or another, and then it just kind of fell out, unfortunately. Um, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, but now I'm back, and they're to me they're doing these empty arena shows in a great way. They're the promotions. Very, whoa, kitty cat! No, 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 no! Leave the headphones alone. Ooh, my God. Can play, you can play with my sweatpants strings. Um, so yeah, the faction warfare is awesome. Uh, they have, say, if um, camera side or camera view, left side of the ring is uh, uh, R.E.D. Red. 
right side of the ring is Team Dragon Gate, and then your hard cam side uh, is Toremon. So they've separated the crowds. You know, think AEW is doing the heel face. Dragon Gate's doing the team. And they, what they do for the teams is a little bit of comedy. They boo the other teams. They they cheer. They are supporting their teams like sports teams would. It's it's pretty cool. I like it. It's uh, So the last Empty Arena show kind of had a lot of brawls happening, uh, uh, such as Okuda ripping um, uh, main man kickboy uh, uh, Ishida, just rips him out of the ring, and they start going to town on each other, and the ref like, oh my god, what do I do? So Gate of Passion happened, and I forgot to mention this on the last cast, but at the end of the last em- Empty Arena show, uh, and I had just asked the question, like, where the hell UT is? Because uh, he's he's one of those like junior vets that just seems to be injured a lot. Well, he announced his return to wrestling from long term injury, and uh, I didn't write it down. I he has to be representing Team Dragon Gate, I would imagine. Uh, so, anyways, before the show, we get a contract signing of the Noah tag title match. Yoshida comes out, chained around his neck with sunglasses on. He looks hilariously great, signed uh, in pictures. Um, Diamante says he's ready tonight. Yoshida then says, uh, <laughs> this is great. These are heavyweight titles. So it's only right to take these titles off a midget and old karate man. I laughed hysterically. Uh, off a midget and a, an old karate man, referencing Marafuji and um, Mochizuki. Marafuji then gets the mic and he mockingly says, uh, Yoshida's Japanese is harder to understand than Diamante's Spanish. Yo, Yoshi just not amused. <laughs> he immediately gets up. How dare you? <laughs> Mochizuki says the only way you'll be able to uh, get to a Noah show in the future is to buy a ticket because you aren't winning these titles. A simple, respectful comment with a nice little jab there. So fair enough. Yoshida was the real star here. I love him. Uh, before the first match, boys in the ring pretend to have a random fan draw for fun, just like their last show, but this time was way better. This time... All the wrestlers in the crowd pretend to be fans, like, <laughs> as they are. Marafuji is now jumping up and down, wanting to be picked. It's hysterical. Uh, well, he does get picked, and he pretends to be an awkward, excited fan. He awkwardly wa- runs the ropes, takes a weak back bump in excitement. Uh, I believe it was Gamma that had the mic. Marafuji nailed all the awkward answers and the fan mannerisms. I was really entertained and laughing here. They ask him how old he is, where is he from? He's like, uh, I'm 40, I'm from uh, Tokyo. And then when he asked uh, his favorite wrestlers, he kept saying Noah guys. So he's like, Misawa. Uh, okay, all right, who else? And then he names uh, another like retired Noah guy. Um, until they finally got really specific with the question. Okay, active Dragon Gate wrestler. And then he says, punch Tom- Tomonaga, just like the show before. So now the running joke is... Punch Tomonaga is the most popular wrestler in Dragon Gate from the quote-unquote fans. And that now is angering quite a few people on, uh, uh, well, Team Torimon and Dragon Gate. So he comes out, takes picture. Punch Tomonaga comes out, takes pictures with Marafuji with his phone, by the way, (laughs) not Marafuji's phone. So it's, it's quite... It's it's great comedy. Uh, the English commentary did a great job uh, translating all of this and getting all of the comedy across. This was great. Good way to start the show. And then just quickly run down the matches. Uh, tag match, Masato Yoshino, Don Fuji, Ryo Saito, and Gamma taking on Naruki Doi, Dragon Kid, Genki Horiguchi, and Yasushi Kanda. A uh, drone makes a distraction to start the match, so Vanguard 1 really gets around, I guess. Uh, note that everybody in this match has a minimum of 20 years experience, while Doi and Yoshino are the youngest in the match, and Yoshino's retiring this year. Good God. Now, the match itself was a fun, experienced, veteran match affair, with everyone working their asses off for no reason. I honestly didn't even know there wasn't a crowd, because this was just very good. Very solid. It ends via Tortolino via the Crucifix pin as Yoshino pins Horiguchi. Post-match, R.E.D. puts the boots to Yoshino as Eita continues to torment main man Yoshino as Eita wants to put his head on his mantle, he says. 
So if this leads to Ata retiring Yoshino by year's end, hell yeah, I'm up for that. That is a great, great uh, way to go out. Tag match, uh, Strong Machine J and Dragon Dia, Dia against, uh, well, Team Hong, Hong Kong, I guess, uh, Ho Ho Loon and Jimmy. He's got to get a new name. A fun junior heavyweight young guy match. Lots of smooth high-speed moves as well. Uh, SMJ here was sticking to his more power move arsenal, which is a really nice change of pace, honestly. I've noticed with the more youthful movement in Dragon Gate that the dudes with different move sets and unique styles, so guys that are separating themselves from, well, Team Dragon Gate, let's say. No, I'm sorry, Team Torimon, uh, for that luchador speed style, uh, those guys, the, these guys that are being more unique are being showcased. There's still the high speed Dragon Gate style, but now with a twist, and it looks, uh, it, it's, it's really fun now. At some point in this match, Jimmy took a hard fall on his back, creating a welt that covered half his back minimum. Uh, just looked absolutely brutal. Jimmy, uh, from China, I don't think he's from Hong Kong, actually, uh, while well, Ho Ho is. I like this team. Makes sense in a sort of countryman tag situation. While Jay and Daya tagging is really nice, I mean, it makes sense, they are the trios champions. Good compliment to each other, D and Jimmy. Have a fun counter for counter ending, leading to a flash dragon Rana on Jimmy from Daya, and Daya gets yet another pin victory, continuing his amazing run. Uh, Team Torimon against Dragon Gate, Ultima Dragon and Yokotsuka, taking on KZ and Kota Minora. Uh, KZ comes out with an air horn to Torimon's total disdain. I laughed. Uh, there was a Susumu kitchen sink spot on Minora, followed up with a good old stomach claw. Ah, oh, I love this. <laughs> uh, this match heavily suffered from no crowd, unfortunately. This one definitely stuck out, stuck, stuck out in a negative way. Uh, just too many slow locking holds, not enough KZ time. Uh, Susumu wins via the Yokotsuka cutter on Minora. So everything makes sense in storyline and push. Uh, this next tag match goes 13 minutes. It's Yamato tagging with most popular man, Punch Tomonaga, taking on Eita and BB Hulk. Uh, this match was way more fun than it had any right to be. The story of Punch Tomonaga continues, and here being the very adamant underdog was fantastic. Him getting beaten up with the weapons by R.E.D., put some sympathy on him, and even Ryo Saito from outside the ring uh, basically being jealous of his new popularity. Hits him with a chair a couple times. That was funny. Uh, the entire last few minutes of the match was all about Punch getting the best of Eita, uh, getting quite a few near falls on him. But ultimately, Yamato and Hulk continued their heat in between it all. Uh, Eita hits Hidalgo after Hulk axe kicks. And uh, yeah, axe kicks Punch. That's not confusing in my notes. Very fun. Recommend this match. Uh, Dragon Gate taking on R Red, uh, Jason Lee, Santa Maria, and Okuda taking on Shimizu, Ishida, and Hio. Uh, so here we go, Mr. Danger Zone, Okuda. Can't wait to see him. He's he's becoming, again, again MMA looks different. He's super tanned up like an 80s dude. Uh, the biggest question for this match going in is what will Shimizu do or accomplish? Will he take the loss, get the win, or something else entirely due to his 2020 negative win rate? Yes, wins and losses matter, and they're making it a huge point that Shimizu is very much on the losing end, and Eita hasn't been happy with him. So we continued our tease with Shimizu versus Santa, Man Santa Maria from the last show, while the rivalry of Okuda and Kickboy Yoshida immediately got off to a heated start, continued throughout the match, leading ultimately to a sequence of exchanges at the end to tease something very good coming between these two. Then something got miscommunicated from Okuda. He tried to save this weird stuffed spot where they collided and just everything came to a screeching halt. Tries a sleeper hold on Ishida. Uh, get, uh, Ishida relatively quickly gets out of this, does a judo throw down, and then they both... This is where it gets weird and okay so now Ishida's on top of him they start exchanging closed fist emphasized shoot shoot like elbows 
Commentary is really putting this over, so it makes me think it was very much a work. And as it turns out, this... I don't think the stuffed spot part was supposed to happen, but it ended up really kind of playing into what they were going for here. So the ref and fellow teammates are unable to separate these two, leads into a no contest, and then post-match, R.E.D. and other Dragon Gate Generation wrestlers go at it, as well as Okuda and Ishida non-stop going at each other. So... Their little shoot fight uh, with this finish and then everyone else kind of uh, getting involved the way they did, this was the right way to do a DQ no contest type finish. It played well off a continuing story. It built up their strife reaching a breaking point. I love this. And hey, I want to see them wrestle. Big thumbs up from me. So I guess they're going to do uh, Ishida Okada for the Brave Gate title. Um, I know there's a weight limit. Maybe they're going to storyline say Okada is in the weight limit. Uh, and then we got our GHC Tag Team Championship match. Marufuji and Mochizuki defending the titles against uh, Team Red, Yoshida, and Diamante. Uh, this match was emphasized by commentary to be under the NOAA tag rules. So no Dragon Gate Lucha tag rules here, and that turned out to be very important later on. So keep that in mind. Yes, I still love Mr. Cyber Kong Yoshida and everything he does in the ring, including uh, to continue to mess up the rules in the match. Uh, his facial expressions were very much on point. Each time, seemingly, uh, R.E.D. would gain a big advantage, or Yoshida would want to come in for Diamante, he would forget to tag, and it just kept building on that. Uh... Mochizuki had the heat put on him for a while when R.E.D. Uh, did have some sort of advantage. Uh, this was, in fact, as much of a good back and forth as you're going to get thinking either team could possibly win. I love the end to this as uh, R.E.D. ran wild, avoiding the Shirnui from Mar Marafuji as Yoshida uh, simply comes up from behind and catches him on the fallback from Diamante. He does end up hitting the Cyberbomb, but hot damn, he wasn't the legal man, as Mochizuki was totally out of it. Uh, they fell to the unfamiliar rules, and in the confusion and be bewilderment at the ref and the audacity to follow the rules, and Yoshida just being this, well, crazy guy, he, he lets everything get the better of him situation, Mochizuki gets back into the action after the Marufuji hot tag. Things turn around almost immediately as the Tag champions hit the double terminator kick Marafuji blackout knee to the back of the head. Marafuji follows it up with Shirinui to win. Love this match and the show as a whole. But again, yet another show we have from Dragon Gate with no direction where the Dreamgate title is heading with its new look and awesome new champion. Uh, I get that it's trying times, but any idea is all I ask for. Just some moniker of... Whom are the guys that want the big fat belt, right? Why is this so hard? It's quite irritating now. You've cooled off Ben K to degrees I can't believe. Naruki Doi is a fantastic champion, but without challengers, he's just hanging out. So, they gotta, they, they again, I get that it's an empty arena, but for fuck's sake... Just give me an idea. All right. Time for the retro segment as Bad Kitty Cat. Jesus. Fight them all. Podcast. Stay away. Drink my beer. My God. Hmm. Okay. Got to play my drop. Where's my bull knock kind of drop? This episode's bull knock kind of heavy. Bum, bum, bum. Yes, baby, all Japan women classics from Proso Dream and Samurai TV. If you follow the Proso Dream on Twitter, you can gain access to the Google Drive to follow along with this podcast in our all Japan Women's Classics Retro Wrestling Rewatch. Well, not rewatch for me. It's the first watch. 
So, uh, all matches from All Japan Women. This is February to March in 1987. All Japan Women Champion Chip is on the line. Bull Nakano is defending the title against Yasuko Ishiguro from the Kawasaki City Gymnasium, February 26th, 1987. Ishiguro is wearing a wacky black and white tiger stripe onesie. Uh, yes, the onesies are still heavy, heavy, heavy in this time timeline. Uh, goes at Bull with a house of fire, but despite her best effort, Bull quickly gains momentum back. Bull has noticeably lost quite a bit of weight in between episode 16 and 17 here, which was November 86 to now in February. So we lost a couple months here. Uh, she proves her new fitness in this by uh, her endurance is way better. It's very noticeable. She's doing move sets changes like cartwheels off the ropes, and she's running the ropes a lot more. This is real cool to see. It's a different Bull Nakano. She's re she's slowly reaching that next level, guys, and I'm very excited. So the match is your basic hard power slams from Bull. Yasuko fighting back only to get shoot pinned in the end, which was the last 30 seconds of just this fight of avoiding the shoot pin. So this was actually pretty cool. Uh, I kind of wish. Imagine this in the modern era today. You have two guys with a big, like, high school, college wrestling background. And the last, you know, 10, 20 seconds is a dude trying to shoot pin him and actually gets it. I think that would be a super cool finish. You know, think of, like, the uniqueness or old schoolness of the figure four pin that we saw in AEW. I want to see something like this in the modern era. And, hey, the crowd reacted as such, so... We both, we both liked it. Me and the 1987 crowd. The next match was... Oh, oh, mwah, 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 mwah. Oh, 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 my God. Lioness Asuka versus Chikusa Nagayo. Same place, same time. This is the number one contender match. Oh, I've heard the stories of this. Okay. One million screaming women chanting for Chigusa in unison, as yes, we are here for the Crush Gals singles match. This was incredible. A pure, pure, pure back and forth between two tag partners, uh, between building their to their biggest moves, you know, jumping heel kicks, big time German suplexes, submission attempts after hitting these lifting knee drops, you name it. Everything seemed to have a point to leading to the next move. I, oh my god, I was able to get this dragon sleeper. I'm going immediately for a leg submission. And they'd fight out of it. Another, oh, I hit you with a... I was able to hit this German suplex move. Well, that gets the back and neck. I'm going to go for a headlock. Oh, it was great. Now, a gripe I could see people saying is, well, with how fast they kept going at each other and kept getting up, there was a lot of no-selling going on. Normally, I would agree with this. this. This opinion over the match. I could see people saying that. So keep that in mind. I love how when they hit a pinning suplex in this match, so think of like a fisherman suplex. Let's say they can't hold the bridge. Well, what would happen, and this happened numerous times, is they would simply float over right away and go for a pin. Simple things matter to me. So these two killed each other and their necks uh, for the better part of 35 minutes. Uh, incredible. The tombstones, jumping, delayed pile drivers, top rope cross bodies. Modern day wrestling match right here turned to 11. Speed, zero time for resting, and yes, this match goes to a time limit draw. This totally works because they went non-stop, and it was a such a competitive nature to it all. That because they weren't resting, the crowd never got to rest. So when the time limit happened, you're just like, fuck, it's over? Oh man, I want to see more. So then the commissioner comes out and he's powwowing with the ref. And he deems the match must continue because of the stakes involved. Okay, fair enough. Crowd explodes into excitement with this announcement. Exhausted, clearly. Both women go at it for another 15 minutes. 
crazy. So it was a 20 minute draw, I believe could have been 30 minute draw and then five overtime minutes. I, I, I literally lost track of time and I had to look up the actual match time online. Uh, so once again, another valiant effort from both. It goes to another draw, another commissioner and ref powwow to decide what's next. They come to the conclusion after these 35 minutes and after all this, it comes to a decision victory for Linus Asuka. Shigusa shakes her hand in congratulations, and they move on. So, in modern eyes, the decision win is dumb. That shouldn't happen. I would rather he said, both will get a title shot, and Asuka will now get the first one, because we believe, by the championship committee, the edge went to her. So they both do win something in the end. Neither technically loses. So if they're going to do this decision, they both get the title shot situation. So who knows? Maybe that's kind of the plan anyways. I know Chigusa Nagayo is due a title shot, right? Uh, so, yes. Um, regardless, utter classic of a match. I, it, this gets an easy high recommendation. Uh, three WA Tag Team Championship on the line here. Red Typhoons uh, defending against uh, Hota and Uno. So uh, this took place at Corican Hall, March 21st, 1987. Typhoons in action here. They won me over in the last episode. And I was like, let's see what happens here. Well, it was a quick back and forth. Both teams really just hit their moves. Simply ends in a draw. That was disappointing. Despite the work effort, it was fine, but I just saw a 30-minute draw. I don't need to see a 10-minute one right after that. So, from the Classics Watch perspective, this was a negative. <coughs> um, and then we got the uh, same show, Japanese Grand Prix 87 League match. Nagayo taking on Bull Nakano. And uh, these two go to a quick 10-minute match that just ends up getting thrown out. Bull still looking looking fit a month later and hangs with Chigusa well enough, but you can definitely tell Nagayo is another level and Bull Nakano it just isn't quite there yet, but they don't want to beat her, right? Because she is on a roll up, right? So Dump Matsumoto's ringside coming off that uh, that big hair versus hair match months ago. Uh, she's looking on, and I guess the story here was for her star pupil to beat her rival and uh, there's a real cool heel kick outside. This is the spot of the match. Uh, Bull Nakano's up against the guardrail. Chigusa Nagayo runs at her, does the jumping spin heel kick, takes them both over the guardrail upon impact. Uh, so they brawl some more, get in the ring. Bull grabs the nunchucks, and there's just too much chaos. The ref calls for the match to be dismissed, and then Dump walks to the back, holding her head, shaking it. Very disappointed. Interesting. Aha. And that's episode 17. Uh hey, if you if you were to watch one match, uh besides the hair versus hair match and then in my opinion, all the dump Matsumoto matches, that Lioness Asuka, Chigusa Nagayo, uh 35 minute draw is very much worthwhile seeing. Um just shows how ahead of their time these women were in all Japan. It's pretty crazy. Now on to the next retro segment. Hooray. Sci fi. There he is. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, ma'am. It is New Japan through the 90s. Uh, the other notable match, I'm going to try to keep up with this, uh, hopefully I can stay with it, is uh, each time I finish a month uh, on this journey, I will seek out uh, something that I think is another good match from outside of New Japan through the 90s, such as All Japan, maybe an old WCW match, uh, something like that. And I hope to continue this uh, through... The decade here. Uh, 
the Sunday, February 24th, 1991 match. The other uh, notable one is the WCW Wrestle War, the war games of the Horsemen. Uh, that is Flair, Barry Windham, and Sid Vicious uh, with Larry Zabisco, of all people. Uh, that is the match where they defeat, uh, well, Team WCW of Sting, Brian Pillman, and the Steiner Brothers. Uh, your bunch of dudes beating the shit out of each other in war games. What's not to like? It's what you think it is, and it delivers. Uh, this is the war games where Sid wins via powerbombing the shit out of Brian Pillman, including crashing his head at the top of the cage. Perhaps you've heard of this. Uh, the finish was El Gigante surrendering on behalf of Pillman. So, good stuff here. And it's funny that I mention El Gigante. Gigante. Uh, because he was on, yes, 1991, March 21st, the Tokyo Dome show in 1991. Oh, man. And this was, in my opinion, way better than the Dome match from 1990, or the, the Dome show from 1990. This, in fact, was the joint Starcade Tokyo Dome show. So, core survival match, uh, eight-man tag. It's Hoshino, Osamu Kido, Kengo Kimura, and Animal Hamaguchi versus Norio Hunaga, Hiro Saito, Tatsutoshi Goto, and oh, Super Strong Machine. I want to see more of Super Strong Machine, but he's not in the archives. I'm so upset with this. Uh, not much of a match here, though. Pretty standard uh, tag in, tag out affair. Strong Machine was the only guy I cared about. Strong Machine accidentally hits Saito and leads to his team immediately getting pinned off it. So uh, This was followed by a trios match. Six-man tag. Uh, uh, Takeyuki Izuka. Um, I think it's the same Izuka, actually. Crazy guy. Uh, Kuniaki Kobayashi and Shiro Koshinaka taking on Z-Man known as Tom Zank, Brian Pillman, look at that, and Tim Horner. Uh, this was pretty damn fun, particularly watching Pillman go at it with his glorious curly mullet and his orange tiger stripe trunks. Z-Man is a Rick Martell look-alike, and as soon as I said that and looked it up, hey, he was trained by Rick Martell. <laughs> so there you go. Wrestled New Japan and Old Japan in the early 90s. Uh, Take that for what it's worth. Anyways, it was a it was a fun it was very fun watching Pillman go. Dragon Suplex pin wins it via pinning Tim Horner. It was fine. I had fun. We had no joke. I am reading this straight from the New Japan Archive site. Uh, New Japan World Steroid Warriors Showdown Match. Scott Norton against Ekura Zaiwa. No, Ekura Ekuraiza. Ekuraiza. There we go. Sheesh. So, for four minutes, these two dudes ran at each other like two semi-trucks, stiff shoulder blocks and clotheslines. The problem was that Ikurizaya, Ikuriza, Ikuriza, Ik okay, he's otherwise known as the Equalizer and Dave Sullivan from WCW. Fuck. So Dave Sullivan is fucking atrocious in the ring. He can't run, and he certainly can't jump. Norton pins him with the worst catch power slam ever because Sullivan is incapable of jumping. This was at least absolutely hilarious to watch because Scott Norton is a killer and he's trying to kill this dude who just stands there. <laughs> it's really funny. Uh, IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship bout. Jushin Thunder Liger taking on Akira. Oh, so, tale of two, two stories for me on this one. On one hand, this match was great with the amount of near falls and building up to one great move after another. Kind of the blueprint for the modern day New Japan match, right? On the other hand, the first match of this match was mostly about Kabuki face-painted Akira here, stopping Liger's high flying with what I can only describe as rest locks, because they weren't they weren't the big time holds following a big move like I saw in the Asuka uh, Nagayo match. This just seemed like they were resting. So nothing was happening. Luckily, once they got past a point, they both went balls to the wall in close falls, high flying. Akira even kicks out of the Liger bomb for an awesome pop and moment. Liger does win via a second rope DDT as Liger stood on the top 
uh, and goes down with it. So just an insane looking move. Rightfully, he wins off it because it looked like he just murdered a dude. I wish more modern day matches would end off a huge move like this instead of it must be their finisher, you know? That's a w very WWE formula. You can only win the match with the, for with, with the finisher. No, if the dude kicks out of your finisher like once or twice, do something else and win off that. That's what I like. So I love this. I love the finish. I love the match in the end. Thumbs up. Uh, we got a tag match of Chono and Saito taking on Arn Anderson and Barry Windham. Horsemen are all over the show, ladies and gentlemen. Chono and Arn had a very simple, effective back and forth. Kind of a clinic on the basics, really. Uh, but really, this match wasn't anything special other than those basic clinics. Very standard affair. Ends in like eight minutes. Uh, so Arn is holding Saito. Uh, Windham bounces off the ropes. Big Lariat on Saito. Arn pins him. There's your finish. Uh, then we had our IWGP Tag Team title match. Kensuke Sasaki and Steven Hiroshi uh, taking on the Steiner brothers. Hiroshi had his moment of flurry to start off the match, but then the Steiners went full suplex the shit out of mo him mode uh, for the basically the rest of the match. Hiroshi took a beating, and it was glorious. This match was a lot of fun to watch. Leads up to a Kensuke Sasaki hot tag, but ultimately he stopped. Got a super bulldog for his trouble. Not much of Kensuke in this match, but hot damn, Hiroshi was great in this. Uh, Steiners win via a Frankensteiner after the Super Bulldog. Battle of the Super High, El Gigante versus Big Cat Hughes. Uh, very tall, 7'7", seven seven, formerly Giant Gonzalez here. Ooh boy, tall man, and it was a showcase of the tall man. Wins via the Iron, Iron Claw inside three minutes. Skip this one. Uh, so this one was tagged. Foreigner tag ability number one strife tag match. Crusher and uh, the Crusher Bam Bam Bigelow and Van Vader, uh, Big Van Vader taking on Ron Simmons and Butch Reed. This was fun in a slow, weird way because basically Bigelow and Vader being big hoss thick boys, being big, uh, lots of body blows, big splashes. Meanwhile, Simmons and Reed would get the occasional power move on them showcasing the strength of their own so they don't look like total chumps. But uh, Vader, Vader and Bigelow took some crazy fucking bumps in this match from getting low, bidged, low bridged over the ropes uh, to power slams right on the bare concrete. That looked like it sucked. Bigelow is totally, totally blown up at the seven minute mark in this match. He can't go anymore. So then Vader just takes the rest of the match solo, basically. Vader proves to be just too awesome. Big splash to Simmons for the win. Post-match, Simmons and Reed go to blows at, a, uh, at each other for the loss. I could watch Vader club dudes all day. This was rather simple, but still fun. Oh, oh yes. Special dream match. The Great Muda versus Sting. This was nuts. Right off the bat, the first couple minutes was Muda going full gear against Sting, pulling off all his hum huge moves, including a moonsault where he lands on his feet and follows up with a jumping heel kick. Sting was no slouch either, uh, as he went all out in his own way, including running crossbody over the top rope to the floor, which was nuts. It was seven straight minutes of nonstop action, really, until the first rest hold from Muda that only lasted all of 20 seconds. Uh, then they went the last three minutes to the finish, where both missed their corner moves, i.e. Muta cartwheel elbow. Sting goes for the Stinger splash, but uh, instead he misses. Uh, the finish was finally Sting looks to hit his Stinger splash for the first time, so it kind of built up to that as he missed beforehand. Uh, gets met with a massive green miss to the face. Muta springboard crossbodies to pin Sting off the missed spot as well. Favorite match of 1991 easily so far from me. Uh, we have titled the greatest 18 club title. Uh, whatever this match is, I, I guess you have to be in the industry for 18 years to qualify to go for this thing. It's Riki Chosu taking on Ty Tiger Jeet Singh. Singh cheats early, hard busting Chosu open. Uh, then it hits a he hits a series of rest holds, screaming at the crowd. Chosu fights back, busting him open, bends his uh, fencing sword over him. Uh, proceeds to hit Sing with it. It's basically a brawl to the finish. Lasts all of ten minutes. I didn't quite care for this one as I am really over the Jeet Sing movement. 
Chosu wins the 1970s style bloodbath match. Fine, but don't have much more to say about this one. Did have a KO finish at the very least, which was interesting. And we finally finish out with the main event. NWA World Title and IWGP Heavyweight Title Championship Bout. Champion versus Champion. Tatsumi Fujinami taking on Ric Flair. Big title v. title bout. And found it funny the ring just covered in blood spatter from the Chosu match prior. Just there. Uh, yeah, they're just kind of hanging out above the blood splatter. Their epic intros. Good stare down before the match starts. I took a picture out on, threw it on Twitter. Really has that big match feel. Again, I have to reiterate that. Both are clearly in this one for the long haul as they lock up. Trade your various basic wrestling holds and maneuvers. Then, naturally, blonde bull cut and all. Flair takes over to his methodical limb work. So, I do enjoy I, I do enjoy this style watching. It's just really a telling sign. You know they're going 20 plus minutes where the first thing they do is that feeling out period. And then to my actual surprise, these two traded off throughout the first half of the match, slowly building to the second half of this 23-minute match. So Flair's standing delayed vertical suplex on Fujinami was a thing of beauty. Now, the second of this nonstop uh, affair was... Um, now the second of was nonstop trades and movement. I think I meant to write the second half was nonstop trades and movement. Anyways. Flair did his uh, up and over the turnbuckle spot. Fujinami, Fujinami met that with a drop kick. And then outside uh, to a guardrail spot, he busts Flair open. So that's cool. As both would then, uh, you know, more or less get a move on each other. And then would counter into a move of their own. That's how the rest of the match would play out. So very much... Similar to the Nagayo uh, Asuka match, but not as fast paced. This truly felt like anybody could win uh, type situation. There was never a moment seemingly either went for their submission finisher, since most of the first half was exactly one of one one another outmaneuvering each other from these submission holds. So good good ring psychology there. Uh, the crowd just kept getting louder and louder into that second half, and then the ref bump happened. There was a couple visual pins from Fujinami on Flair, and then one immediately would think, oh, the ref's going to get back up, and Flair will get the pin after cheating. Sure enough, Flair rakes the eyes, and he tries, but no! There's in fact still no referee. The ref is trying to be revived, and then finally, another big roll-up by Fujinami with a revived ref just in time. He gets the pin to an utter Deafening crowd reaction and ovation. What a really cool moment. And while the match is very much on that more simplistic 80s style, this still holds up. But from what else took place in the card, this match also felt to me the last of kind of the previous generation. Where the undercard matches and guys with their faster style, it was on the cusp of them taking over and uh, beating them to more or less take their own star power, right? But for now on this day, Fujinami, Fujinami stands on the top of the wrestling world. Thumbs up. So next up on the New Japan 90s docket is the uh, Super Junior Cup Finals of 91 from April 30th, and then the May 31st Osaka Castle Hall Show, featuring the start of Fujinami's big title run against the upcoming New Generation, and the feud of Vader versus Flash Scott Norton. Oh, baby. Looking forward to that. And my mom will be reviewing New Japan through the 90s with me for the next episode. So look forward to that, everybody. And now it's time for the last segment. Hooray, we've made it. Here we go. Yes, all right. WCW Nitro, October 26, 1998. The night after Halloween Havoc. Yes, it's the Fallout show from Phoenix, Arizona. Recap from Havoc includes Bret Hart retaining the U.S. title and injuring Sting. Hogan beat Warrior in 
An atrocious match involving a dumb swerve with Horace and a botched flash paper spot. Rick Steiner won the tag titles all by himself after Buff Bagwell betrayed him to nobody's surprise. Then beat brother Scott Steiner in a no DQ match with plenty of NWO run-ins. And finally, Goldberg retained the heavyweight title versus DDP in a real good 10-minute match. So Nitro begins with explaining the it is idiocy behind Havoc running long, because it was well over three hours, like almost three and a half. And the cable companies, I looked this up, the cable companies just ended up shutting the pay-per-view off halfway through the Hogan Warrior match and totally missing the Goldberg DDP main event. So, Tony Schiavone is telling us, the television audience, and explaining all this, and then he's adamantly saying, this is not a ratings ploy, and here I am thinking, oh, you fuckers, you rating ploy bastards. Turns out, as I checked this evidence, WCW was so incompetent that they, they, they just fucked up so hard that this is indeed not a ratings ploy. They're trying, they have to make it up to the viewers. And even Vince McMahon himself got his lawyers involved and called the cable companies claiming of WCW's rating ploy. This is amazing. So WCW, uh, after much deliberation, has decided to show us the top of the hour, the entire Goldberg DDP title match, but won't show us the Hogan Warrior match because it's, they deem it too violent and heinous for TV. A.K.A. Just admit the match was so awful that they don't want to ruin any images of the wrestlers. <laughs> the irony. Of course it's not fair, because they didn't get to see the finish of the match. And this proves it's not a ratings ploy. Financially, this fuck-up alone cost WCW $1.5 million. Basically, everybody took their refunds when they were offered. Let alone the outstanding amount of money they paid Mr. Warrior one million fucking dollars for this. Unbelievable. So meanwhile on Raw, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin wins an I Quit match versus Ken Shamrock due to uh, shenanigans involved. Uh, of course. And even though uh, nobody said I quit, the ref calls it off anyways. So said shenanigans indeed. So Raw sucks too, still. Uh, also coming off the heels of Brawl for All, which was uh, the last like couple months. So... You can only imagine. First match was Kenny Chaos of High Voltage versus Stevie Ray. Dear God, why? Like, it, it, they are losing in a ratings war now. And you start off your three-hour wrestling show with Kenny Chaos and Stevie Ray. It goes 90 seconds until Bagwell comes out for a distraction, throws a slapjack to Stevie Ray, cracks chaos with it, lifting pedigree, wins. Awful. Yeah, definitely not a ratings play. I believe you now. Uh, Rick Steiner comes out, chases them away from the beatdown. He says he needs a partner to fight the NWO later tonight, and he wants Kenny Chaos to be his partner. Oh, God. So it turns out Rage is hurt, says Chaos, so he needs a partner. He idolizes Rick. He accepts. I guess story-wise it's fine, but dear God. Canyon versus Prince I.K. is the next match. Modern day indie match exchanging a large amount of moves. Very 50-50 affair until Canyon wins with the Flatliner. Done and done. Flair and the Horseman. And you'll, you'll see in the next coming weeks, because uh, I've already watched a good chunk of next week's Nitro, that this formula I'm about to go on for Nitro is going to be a pattern seemingly going forward as I've seen. Flair and a horseman come up talking up talking partying uh, in Vegas. They don't know where Mongo is. Bischoff then comes out, says he admits he's wrong. The people want to see Flair wrestle, so tonight you will see him wrestle. But not now. <laughs> As Flair's like, I'll get ready in 10 minutes. No, 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 no. So, more on that later. Barry Horowitz versus Alex Wright. Uh, this match was more funny than anything else. A real bad jumping boot spot happened from Alex Wright, and Wright wins off the neckbreaker. Horowitz is a good jobber. Uh, recap of the Dun Hog dumb Hogan match uh, featuring the Swerve of Horus. So I've already adamantly and vehemently expressed my 
dislike of this whole Horus Hogan angle. Uh, Wrath versus Sick Boy. My main man Wrath got too much offense from Sick Boy here. It killed the crowd. Very ashamed of Wrath letting this Sick Boy get something in on him. Meltdown finish. Crowd pop for that at least. Bummer. This was not good. Can't build a killer and then have the jobber get offense in. Can't do that. Replay of the Goldberg DDT DDP match in its entirety, which in fact got the largest television ratings to date. <laughs> uh, afterwards, Zabisco on commentary says fans will always pay to see great competition or else it gets stale. Oh, if he only knew. So now to the back with Kevin Nash. Mean Gene at, and Kevin Nash is in this room sitting on a couch. Mean Gene asks him why, after all that build and getting a match at Halloween Havoc versus Scott Hall, he walks away for the countout loss after hitting Hall with two power bombs. No less infuriating the fan base. Nash says it wasn't about winning or losing because fuck it, right? It w it was about helping out his old friend. I call bullshit immediately, and nonetheless, Hall shows up. And both guys start mumbling. Can't hear a goddamn word either say. And because Gene is so short compared to these two and he only has one mic, doesn't help matters. Then as Hall, I guess, kind of says, oh, maybe you're right, Nash. That's an immediate swerve. Giant shows up and they both chuck Nash through a drywall over the couch. It's a cool crash. And then when the camera looks inside the hole, Nash vanished. Horrible segment. This is horrendous. Hogan and the NWO come out for 15 minutes, blah, blah, blah. They induct Horace into the group, who fucking raw. 15 stitches in Horace's head. Later, as a proof initiation, swerve. Fuck, man. Saturn, with his new BDSM gear, dropped the army stuff from Havoc versus Eddie Guerrero. A uh, bunch of cool suplexes from Saturn. Eddie hits his cool Lucha stuff. And just as Saturn was about to hit the DVD, LWO runs in like six dudes. Uh, supposedly one of them is Eddie's cousin or something. You never see him again, to my knowledge. Lays out Saturn as he tried to fight them off. Whatever. Just doing the same NWO shit, and now you have the Mexicans with t-shirts doing it too. Hooray. Mean Gene interviews Judy Bagwell. Yes, one Judy Bagwell. Judy loves Marcus. He's disgraced the name of Bagwell. Mother on a mission, she is. And she's had enough of buff. Oh, the fans hated this. <laughs> they booed her out of the building. She was kind of good by standing up to Scott Steiner, and she ran her course. But no, oh no. There's so much more to come of Judy Bagwell. <laughs> Giant and Stevie Ray versus Rick and Chaos. Here we are. What a clusterfuck of a match this was. Nothing but miscommunication and botched moves. No surprise with Stevie Ray involved. And actually, Giant and Rick Steiner were even worse, somehow. Nothing they did was right. There was a real weird crisscross spot uh, at the end where Rick and Stevie <coughs> are running, and then Giant stops on a dime, turns around, and closes Chaos out of the ring. Rick pins Stevie with the Bulldog. Very weird. Giant don't give a fuck anymore. He's fat, he's slow, he's only joking. Like, forget it, right? He's out. He's on his way out to WWF in a couple months. Uh, Bischoff is now at the announce table, so here we go. <coughs> here we go. It's Ric Flair time. We get to see him wrestle. And then Bischoff goes, and here's Bash of the Beach from 1994 of the title match. <coughs> and Shivani's like, wait, what? He's like, Flair's got to wrestle. Oh, no, no, no. He isn't clear. He'd never pass a physical. And Tony Schiavone immediately calls bullshit. Heenan's kissing up to the boss, saying, well, he must be hurt. Shivani's like, he's not hurt? It's so good. Uh, so Bischoff's just kind of cackling because this is the match where Hogan very much one-sides the match against a heel chicken shit Flair in 94. So you only see clips of Flair getting his ass beat by Hogan. I actually really loved this segment. Because Bischoff comes up, comes across as a total dick heel ass. And the commentary team sold it so well. And you got to see a classic match. A very much doctored classic match, but a classic match nonetheless. Uh, so it was great. Sometimes you gotta kiss up to the boss, man, says Heenan. It was great. 
Hoovy versus Kidman, great match, but unfortunately nobody cared. Uh, nobody cared at all until the end. Um, Kidman wins via the shooting star. A shining light on this darkness does exist. I say, way better than either Havoc or Disc, uh, either Havoc Disco and Further Inferno matches. Especially better than last week's Mysterio Jr. draw match. So Buff comes out, and his message for all the mothers out there is to for them to basically stay in line and ask Dad to set Mom straight. So definitely a heel line. Then Scott Steiner, well, he comes out with him, and he asks J.J. Dillon to come out and demands J.J. say who his favorite Steiner is. Because he's like, I betrayed WCW. Come on, you like Rick Moore. <laughs> I'm a dick heel. Come on, you like Rick Moore. And JJ, of course, won't say this because he doesn't want to get his ass beat by the psycho. Of course, Scott kicks his ass anyways. And a bunch of dudes immediately hit the ring. They try to break it up. Steiner is doing his best to put the recliner in JJ Dillon. And they go to a commercial mid this brawl. And so it was really cool. Uh, and then we get back from the break. And um, I was kind of hoping that they'd still be in the brawl, but no, Warriors music hits. His awesome WCW music, by the way. Cuts a big hometown promo. Well, I guess ha uh, Havoc uh, wasn't his last appearance. Same Warrior play, same Warrior channel shtick. Hogan comes out with the NWO. Warriors successfully fends them all off. I don't know how, but this turned out to be a pretty awesome segment. Two in a row! Three if you... No, four if you include the Hoovy Kidman match and the Bischoff segment. So, awesome stuff. Uh, yeah, so even uh, WCW knew to put guys over as hometown heroes. Shame I never want to see either of these dudes ever wrestle again. Uh, Luger and Conan are taking on the team of Scott Hall and Scott Steiner. So, Battle of the Scots, or Team Scott. This goes nowhere. They brawl in and out of the ring. There are chairs everywhere or whatever. They're just hitting each other with shit. The bell never rings. This match does nothing. And then they go to a commercial. And when we come back, Shivani just goes nonchalantly, what a brawl. Like, what? It's over? <laughs> what happened? Why? And then we get our main event. <laughs> because I don't recall them ever mentioning the main event once. Because you would think a U.S. title match of DDP and Bret Hart would be big news. Uh, so I to if they mentioned it, I totally missed it. Uh, but yeah, it's a U.S. title match. I mean, awesome, but why? Uh, DDP just lost last night. Uh, but anyways, this was just like in August when Bret Hart put the title up against a random Lex Luger. And then uh, it kind of works the same way, where Bret goes for the gimmick. He gets met with a diamond cutter. And he, get, and he gets pinned, right? There was some good, you know, choreographed offense. It was kind of noticeable, but post-match, Brett beats his ass, cracks his knee and leg repeated with a chair. Uh, nobody comes out to help poor Diamond Dallas Page. The people's champion, the people didn't help him. Good match and finish. And now there is two straight crazy injury angles from Bret Hart. He's taken out Sting and he's taken out DDP. And if we remember the Bret Hart history over the course of 98, as poorly booked it was, and him not featured, he was a hit man. He took out Booker T, he took out Benoit, and he took out DDP Pryor as well. So here we go, we're back to hitman business. Uh, Goldberg charges the ring, uh, I could only assume late, uh, because as soon as he hit the ring, they go off air. So a cliffhanger ended for Nitro, a besides the random Luger Conan shit, uh, the last hour of Nitro was awesome. I really enjoyed it, but those first two hours were pretty damn horrendous. Uh, so yeah, no Goldberg on the whole fucking show as your main champion, except you know they replayed the uh, the title match, but no, you want to see your champion live, and he is just he's there for two seconds. Unbelievable. So we are on our way to World War III, the big 60-man battle royal, and then to Starcade. Now it's time for the wrestler rankings. As I close it out. And this was hard. I mean, basically, if you are running a show <laughs> and you have a moniker of, of being impressive, 
you will be on here. So uh, I'm actually going to go with the men first. 15, Marafuji. 14, Yoshino. 13, Eddie Edwards. 12, Matt Hardy. 11, Yoshida. 10, Dragondia. Dragondia. 9, Keisuke Okada. 8, Kaito Ishida, Mr. Kickboy. 7, Best Friends. 6, Chris Jericho. 5, Lance Archer. Love his squash matches. 4, The North. 3, Kenny Omega. 2, Sean Spears. And 1, American Road. American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes. American Rhodes. And then the women. 10, Rina Yamashita. 9, Tei Honma. 8, Risa Sara. 7, Tsukushi. 6, Shuri. Uh, 5, Anna J. Loved her match. For Kira Hogan, didn't mention her good singles match she had against Suzy uh, on the Impact show. Three, B- Britt Baker, two, Hikaru Shida, and one, Tessa Blanchard. That one, two, three was just super easy to do. And there you have it. Those are the wrestler rankings. That closes out this episode. I hope everyone enjoys. This was episode 55 of the Red Leaf Retrocast Wrestling Edition, Empty Arena Passion. See you next time. Let's cue that and cue that exit music. If I can frickin' find it. There it is.